All right. Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, been quite a few days since we've been back on here. Hopefully everybody had a, a good week. I know the weather's been kind of crazy down here on the Gulf Coast. Uh, three night, two or three, two days ago, I was running air conditioner today. I'm sitting here with a sweater on inside my own house. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, tonight's lesson is, uh, of course, patient assessment. And it does start off very basic and advanced, uh, advanced on up. And uh, it's uh, a lot to cover in this lesson. That's why it's broke up over two class periods. So uh, what we're going to get into tonight, is the patient assessment, when we uh, think of that, it's not always, we people want to think, hey, it's, you know, it's hands-on, it's touching the patient, it's looking at them. Uh, which that is a big part of it. However, your patient assessment really should start whenever you actually get the, the, the call. And uh, you try to get into your, uh, what we call situational awareness in order to be able to uh, try to figure out what's uh, going on, try to prepare what we need uh, before we ever get to the call. And it's uh, simply the location uh, how far out you are from uh, from a definitive care, or you know, you're possibly going to need a flight service or something like that on standby. So th all this is kind of uh, gathered up into it needs to become kind of routine. When I say routine, is you get your s system in place to where you don't leave out. If you jump around, you're going to miss something. And uh, but we'll, later on, we'll get into where you know you've got a general appearance assessment, and then you've got then a focus assessment. But uh, for the most part right now, this includes your scene size up, uh, primary, secondary assessment, patient history, and what your resources are in order how to, uh, to treat this patient. Uh, we always hear about scene safety from the beginning. Even when you take your national registry, EMTs, it's kind of uh, people walk in the room and they board out, you know, uh, scene safety, BSI, and then go from there. But uh, scene safety with uh, What's going on in the world today? It's you know it's very unstable out there. You know, just this past week, I had a couple of calls where you know I didn't feel comfortable with the scene because there was a lot a big crowd. Some of the some of the calls were uh, had a potential violent atmosphere to it. So uh, if a scene's not safe, you should even you know go into there without knowing that it is because uh, EMS responders, fire department, they're easy targets. They most, for the most part, people know that they're not armed and uh, a lot of times have no way of fighting back. We've had when you calls for, and we've, I've had one of these in the last week for the, they, the caller said, hey, don't send the police, just send the ambulance. Well, who do you think they're going to send first when that happens? And that's because uh, you don't know, you don't know what's going to go on with the scenes today. Uh Three calls I've ran this past week where a crowd was standing around video and everything they'd done, everything that happened. So, uh, you know, you got uh, the potential for crowd violence. A lot of people are just looking for problems. Scene safety also, like, oh, you know, pulling up to a house, you know, how does it look on the outside? Uh, lights on? Is it dirty? There are a lot of cars in the driveway. Uh, seemed like ever, just about every house I went to this week in our area is. It's like they uh, run out of light bulbs. It's always dark. You can't see where you're going into, you know, big dogs. Uh, one call in particular was uh, where a man was calling. He lived in this, uh, this kind of an old uh, recreational shed that they turned into a house and it was divided in half. The guy in the back room called, but the guy in the front room didn't know about it. So when we go in, he's got a shotgun by his couch and a big pit bull dog laying in the living room. So you can... Uh, you can never be too uh, too wary about that. And not only assess the scene safety, but you know how are you going to manage that scene when you get there? Uh, scene management can be like if you got a patient that's out in the cold on the side of the road, taking care of that right away. One of the biggest killers in shock and trauma is hypothermia. One of the most important pieces of equipment you can have on your ambulance is a blanket, especially this time of year. Uh, dress, uh, hazards that may be in the area, like we, we talked about, uh, dogs could be a violent crowd. It could be uh, a lot of you are firefighters, so you know more about some of those hazardous materials uh, uh, than I do. I just want to stay away from them, let the fire department handle them. Other resources that may be in uh, that that may be needed, or 
how far away are they and the standard precautions. Uh, ever, a lot of people have the idea that PPE is something new with COVID. However, if you think back, uh, we, we should have always had the standard precaution PPE in place, which for the most part, basic, nothing less than uh, gloves. Uh, even the, the N95s have always supposed to have been on the ambulance. There's other things that can hurt you besides COVID that's been there way before COVID. And you got your meningitis, uh, uh, TB, things of that nature. And of course, you know, how many patients do you have? That's one uh, of the, uh, that, that's one of the, uh, criteria like a lot of the reporting now how many patients was on scene because they do use those statistics and stuff like that little dogs uh some of you have been attacked by dogs i've had a i had a uh i guess it was a rat terrier this man was having a seizure when i went to grab him to roll him over this dog came from somewhere i don't know where it came from but it bit into my it bit into my hand its teeth was tangled into my glove so here i am whipping this dog around the room because he's stuck in my glove and he's clamped down on me and uh, the man still sees them, so the woman's uh, freaking out because I'm hurting her dog, and she starts hitting me with a broom. And uh, it was, uh, I, I left outside, went in the yard. Dude's still in there seizing, but I had to get that dog off of me, and now I was worried about her shooting me. So things can go to go to hell in a handbasket pretty quick sometimes. Uh, violence. As I used to be a former safety manager for a big EMS company, and uh, we would have a lot of assaults. Uh, it, the EMTs would get assaulted in case one girl, she was a pr pregnant paramedic. She ended up losing a child because she got kicked in the stomach. So you, uh, some people will play nice until you get away from the scene, get away from the police or somebody else that they may consider uh, threatening and then come unglued on you on the way. So you can always abandon the scene. I've put people out of my truck and I've got out of the truck before myself. So that, uh, That's things you need to be thinking of before you even get there. So you you, uh, you don't want to be that person that doesn't make it home. I'm sure all you have families and a lot of in a life outside of EMS. The uh, primary assessment. I've seen a lot of testing stations and things like that. People start doing their ABCs and that and there'll be a problem with it and they'll start going on and assess. You know you. You do not leave the primary until it's taken care of and resolved. Sometimes you may not even ever get to the secondary survey. And uh, when you walk into a room or see the patient, when you first see the patient, your primary survey has begun. You want to look at their appearance, overall appearance, are, and uh, of course their LOC. The, uh, are they able to be aware of you? I, last night I had a patient that was altered, and I, I would continue asking him the same questions just to see what, what response I was tracking. So level of consciousness, that's not something you do uh, at the initiation of the assessment. And forget about it. You need to do that all the way through continuous and note those changes. So they because they, they can change, they can deteriorate. Are they transient? Is it something that uh, sometimes when we get into head trauma, someone with an epidural hematoma will have sometime an interlude of uh consciousness to where they may be they may get knocked out and then uh, a few minutes later they're wake alert and oriented they're, they're fine and uh and then a lot of time it'll set in on them a, a couple hours later they'll start getting combative or head injuries that's something that happens a lot of times with the uh epidurals and a lot of refusals are got during that time as well uh Airway, breathing, circulation. It, I have seen people get distracted at a gunshot wound in the chest and start uh, treating it. And they've actually not even noticed that their patient wasn't breathing. So that's just, it's so easy to be distracted. And during these times, uh, when you do feel distracted, you've heard me say before, when you feel distracted or judgment clouded, fall back on your training. What does your training say? Airway. What does your training say? Be, uh, breathing. Then circulation. What's included in circulation? You know, it's control of hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. If any of you have uh, not taken PHTLS yet, I uh, encourage you to do that. Their uh, assessment is XABC. It starts off with exanuating hemorrhage because it doesn't matter what else is going on. If you're bleeding to death, if you don't stop it, nothing else is going to matter very long at all. Uh, 
correct life threats as you find them. Hey, I got a, I, I've got a sucking chest wound. Deal with that. Stop there. Nothing else matters. If you, if you uh, go past it, you're gonna m miss up and trip up on it. So follow. Th this is something that I have to stop and think about. Uh, follow my training. Okay, airway, breathing, circulation. Do I have anything else wrong with these things right here that I need to fix? And then you move on. Uh, it is possible to discover life-threatening situations uh, throughout the uh, later into your secondary. And uh, you have to stop and go back and take care of it. General impression. Now, this is kind of like a field diagnosis where you need to have an idea of what's going on with the patient. What do I get from this? What do I see? If this patient looks sick, hey, you know, it, it, it's uh, I walk in a room, I had this guy that he's modeled, he's uh, tripod position. What's my impression? Okay, uh, severe shortness of breath, possible cardiogenic shock. What's, what are you getting from this? What did you take away from this that might be going on? So initial general impression, what's their status? Are they acute, non-acute? We call it just load and go or stay and play. Uh, start your interventions when, when you first discover, like if they're not breathing right, you deal with that. A lot of people say, okay, I, I note, I've noted this part. I've noted that their respirations are irregular and they're ineffective. And then I'll go check other things. You know, you need to stop right then and correct that. And that's what, and sometimes it's hard to do. It's, this is, this is why we go over this again to implement this on you to require training. Now you may note things. Hey, I saw that. I'll get to that in a minute, but first I got to deal with this. The, uh, History taken is not always something that you can get right away. A lot of poor historians out there, and many times they will tell the hospital or another provider something totally different than what you were told, and different people at the scene will give a different account of what's going on. So the chief complaint, we need to know why. This is simply, why did they call me? What is their interpretation of they call me? It doesn't matter what you see at this point, what are they complaining of? You know, you may see that they've got a spear through their back, but they called you because their head's hurting. It's that the other part we'll, we'll take care of in a minute. But right now, why did they call me? What is the main issue that they're having? Uh, what did this call from? Is it, it, are they sick or did something from the outside get, uh, take care of this? We've got to determine that, uh, what people refer to it as MOI or mechanism of injury, the nature of illness. We know what, What's causing this? Okay, here's what they said. What do I see that might have caused this? What's associated with it? Well, they're, they're complaining of severe abdominal pain. Uh, had some nausea and uh, diarrhea from it. What else is going on? Well, they're vomiting. Uh, is it blood or anything like that into it? No, it's pretty normal. So these are some things that go along with it. Any shortness of breath. Uh, any type of numbness or tingling, anything go with all that would be associated signs and symptoms. Now we'll talk more about signs and symptoms in just a minute, but then, you, you know, investigation of the chief complaint, sometimes you can't really get a good complaint or one that is uh, accurate or precise. A lot of times it's pretty general. Well, I've got this or, and one, one thing I hate when I ask somebody what's wrong with them is, Hey, you name it. Uh, the past medical history can contribute to your kind of going along your impression or to determine the acuteness of the event. Now, someone, you got someone that has, uh, you go to some place, the chief complaint is a seizure. Uh, do they have a past medical history of this? If they've had seizures in the past, even though it's acute, it's a bad thing. Uh, if they've had seizures in the past, it's not as an acute event as someone that has never had one before. So maybe they've had epilepsy since a child, their own medication have been treated for it. They know that they're not a real big acute cause in this. Now, someone that's uh, 30 years old, all of a sudden has a seizure out of the blue, never had one before. You know, you got to start thinking, Hey, is this a, uh, you know, is this could be a brain tumor or an aneurysm or something else could be going on. So that's something that we need that really need to include into it. Someone that has a fever of 105 that has a history of HIV, 
that happens. Someone with a history of uh, someone with a temperature of 105 that has no other medical history, that's something that needs to really be investigated. You know, and the, there are some things that you need to state and f make sure that it's not going on. Now, when we talk about pertinent negatives, what if uh, if I'm on the other end of the hospital uh, uh, radio getting a report, and you talk about hey, someone uh, sometimes you do cover it. Hey, this patient has uh, been in the MVA. He was a restrained uh, front seat passenger. An airbag did deploy. He's complaining of a headache. However, he denies neck and back pain. That are pertinent negatives. Uh, another one, hey, I get a call. The guy's having shortness of breath. However, he denies chest pain. So you got to uh, let's clear up what other big questions it might not be that might be there. Uh, think about it yourself. You know, you've heard other people giving hospital reports and things in the past. And uh, and you kind of like well asking maybe you, you, you critique you, you critique each other you do and it's not a bad thing it's because you learn from that and uh, but it's like oh they didn't say this or they didn't say that or did they do this you know patient has an altered LOC it was found in his kitchen uh, and uh, uh, well we're on the way to the hospital with him now you know you're gonna start thinking well wait a minute uh, you, you you probably can tell the questions that you need to ask just by hearing that. Hey, what's his blood sugar? Has this ever happened before? Is there any alcohol involved? So, or you could say something like patient, uh, that's when you would rule it out. So the patient has an altered LOC. He's got a GCS of uh, 13. Uh, however, what I can understand from him, he doesn't look to be in acute distress. There's no work of breathing. Uh, he has symmetrical facial tone, which I'm ruling out stroke. See, I'm getting, those are pertinent negatives, things like that. So you want to kind of, uh, keep them from falling into different categories if you know uh, of what to look for with that. Now, secondary assessment does not start until the primary is done. All of these other ones that I just showed you, uh, past medical history and things like that is really, that isn't, that isn't history taken. And as you can see, that really comes after primary. Primary, then you get into your history taken, past medical history and things like that. Uh, then you can start doing your secondary. You know, a rapid full body scan. You know, if you don't look for it, you're probably not going to find it. Uh, I've seen where patients, uh, well, I say patients. I was, uh, had a complaint one time of a me medic where the doc called and said, hey, your medic missed a, uh, a gunshot wound. And boy, that gets everybody's attention. It causes you to put your coffee down and say, okay, what's going on here? And so I start getting my questioning together. I'm still caught off guard real bad. You know, I'm really distracted with that. And so the uh, doctor says, yeah, man, uh, the guy come in, he's elderly male. He's bedridden at home, bedridden at home. Now listen to this bedridden at home, uh, complaining of a uh, chest pain and shortness of breath. Well, you know, if you was to call that report in, Hey, you know, uh, exam looks to be a traumatic. I see no, uh, atraumatic in the head, chest is symmetrical, uh, no crepitus, no deformity, bilateral breast sounds are clear. I mean, just, just things like that would, you know, I listened to the tape that was given. So the doc does an x-ray and he sees a foreign object on the x-ray. And it turned out that uh, that was a, a bullet. And there was no entrance wounds or anything like that on the torso. So, uh, after a long investigation, and and I couldn't say anything to my medic because the only reason the doc found it was he found it on an x-ray. But what had happened was his uh, wife, who had Alzheimer as well at home, uh, sh shot him in the perineum behind the scrotum with a 25 automatic, and that's where it ended up at in the chest like that. So now... He asked me, he said, so am I going to have to start looking under? No, I'm not saying that. That is an unusual, unique circumstance. However, uh, you got to look for things in order to find it. Now, please understand, I'm not telling you to start going examining everybody between the legs. If they complain of chest pain, you may get into another conversation with that. That's just, I'm just throwing that out there. It's like, hey, that was an incident that happened. And it's like, hey, the guy said, he said, I looked everywhere I was supposed to, and given what he had, he certainly did. I, I, that was just a far-fetched call, and yeah, we just left it at that. Uh, 
you know, the respiratory system, you, you can examine that from across the room when you walk in. That exam is pretty much in your general appearance. Uh, work of breathing. Hey, how fast are they breathing? Are they having trouble with it? Are they using any type of accessory muscles or anything of that nature? Uh, can I hear them breathing? You know, when I'm looking, when I'm talking to this person, when I'm just, you can, some things can work simultaneously. Uh, when I see that uh, I'm talking to him and I'm like, well, he's kind of ticket Nick. He's trying to breathe in fast and he's got a little bit of uh, accessory muscle use. And he's really, uh, you know, about every six, seven words, he's got to take a breath. So I know, I, I feel there's a problem there like that. And I can do that just by looking at it. And then I may want to listen to it. If you say you listen to breath sounds, you better listen to them. A lot of people, I hear general reports, and I've seen it, but by a little breath sounds clear your auscultation. Uh, I was a brand new EMT at the time, and I didn't get a good history because I was inexperienced, just didn't know better. The guy had absent breath sounds on one side, so I'm hauling, uh, hauling butt to the hospital, priority one, thinking I got a big pneumo, and turned out, you know, I did listen, didn't hear any breath sounds on that side, but it turned out that the guy had a lung boogle 10 years ago. So, it, see how all that can play into space? play into that history, take and go into that. And if I had a good history, I wouldn't have been alarmed by it. But since I didn't, uh, that's why I was kind of freaked out about the guy had a big pneumo. Now, breath sounds, when we get into this later, we'll get into more of this in little detail. Uh, you'll hear a lot of discussion about that. A lot of people are unsure about breath sounds because it's something that, uh, I mean, people's got different hearing levels and things like that. And what you may interpret as, uh, and give it a name, I may, uh, Look at look at another description of it, and of course, uh, cardiovascular. We got a pump, heart rate, regular rhythm. How fast? How slow? A lot of times when you're doing a fast assessment, and you'll get you'll get to where you can do this, is uh, sometimes all you need to know is it fast or slow. Now, how fast is fast, and how fast is slow? Well, just think about what the normal parameters are. You know, if I uh, grab somebody's wrist, this guy is very, very sick, and I grab his wrist, and I'm not, I'll get a more accurate thing right now. But right now, I'm in my quick head to toe trying to figure out. Try, I'm looking for problems right now. It's pretty much what a, a exam is, is you're looking for problems. I may just grab that heart rate. I may feel the radio pulse. Okay, I don't feel it. Okay, I got a brachial. Okay, and it's breathing. And I said, well, that's, that's pretty fast. Right now, that's all I'm worried about. I have no radial but I've got a real rapid brachial. What does that tell me? This guy's compensating or he picks him to not be compensating. Right now, I don't need to sit there and say, okay, well, it's 150. That's not going to do me any good. Right now, I'm just trying to make a rapid, quick determination of what's going on with them. Uh, a neurological exam, for the most part, takes patient cooperation. Now, somebody that is totally out of it, LOC of uh, six or seven, you're not going to be able to determine a lot of time if they've got equal hand grips, bilateral, uh, no drift and things like that. So you look at things just like, well, they were posturing. Well, was it the corticate or the cerebrate? Is it one side or was it the other? Are they able to follow commands? All this, uh, are they able to uh, maintain their own airway? Do they have uh, snoring respirations? If they got snoring respirations, for the most part, you've got a neurological problem. And of course, the musculoskeletal system. Are any bones sticking out? Do I see anything abnormal? Do I see any blood underneath the patient? Uh, any blood coming from it and of uh and what area might that be in now we talk about lung sounds for a minute i don't have any videos and stuff right now with it but i'll try to get some for friday so you can listen to it but uh the, the when you listen to lung sounds you need to go whatever side that you're on uh, left to right same level left to right same level go and you need to listen under the arms you need to listen into the back because you actually have more surfaceable, I mean, availability of surface, like under the arms. That is a great place to listen to lung sounds, under the arms, along the ribs, and those axillary areas. A lot of times in the front, you know, if somebody's got big pectoral muscles or big breasts, it's going to kind of, uh, you, it's going to be insulated. Sometimes you can't really tell what's happening with that. So sometimes you can go back just past uh, the pectoral muscle or where the breast uh, attaches to the body. A lot of time your breast, your best breast sounds will be right in those areas. Uh, you need to determine how, is it just a little bit of the lung getting breath or is it all of it? So note that, hey, I hear, uh, 
If you've got chest trauma or a suspected, a suspected respiratory issue, you want to uh, do a full evaluation of that part. You know, you want to say, hey, they don't have any, you know, the neck is supple. There's That means they can move it around with no problem. There's no JVD. Uh, and like I said, I won't give an assessment or a report like this with every patient. Like if someone's going to broke leg, I probably won't talk about this. But if they got something that's causing them to have problems breathing or respiratory issues, I'm going to note that, hey, so the trachea was midline because you don't want to get to the hospital. And say, hey, man, this trachea is pushed plumb back under the neck muscle. What happened here? So you want to make those notations. Okay, trachea's midline. Is it tugging? Uh, intercostal uh, or accessory muscle use around the neck and the trapezius muscles. Do I have symmetrical chest movement? You want to note that. Uh, is there crepitus or deformity? I hear bilateral breath sounds, and it's positive in the apexes and the bases. You know, you want to you want to listen to those areas to make sure it's getting all the way around. Uh, you know, it's not just trauma patients that get pneumothoraxes. So you might want to say, hey, uh, doc, earlier I heard it under the arms. However, now at this point, I'm not. So you want to follow up on people that are, that have those kind of complaints. It's uh, I took a patient the other day that I listened to him all around, uh, just like I described. And. I had full, and I noted I had breast sounds in the apexes and the bases, axillary areas, and all lung fields. So if you're going to say all lung fields, kind of give an idea. And it just simply is another that shows you made a, a little bit better effort to get this. Hey, well, he noted that they were in the apex and the bases. So this patient got worse after he uh, had had encountered him. And, you know, when we get to the hospital, this guy had a simple pneumothorax. And uh, the doctors, and I come in later, I said, hey, I heard that guy had a pneumo. He said, yeah, but he said, I didn't find it until I did the x-ray. So, uh, you know, you, you can't feel bad about that. But I did make the determination, hey, I looked for it. You know, I didn't just bring it in and say I did. It happens. Now, these are, uh, monitoring devices and things like that are great tools, great tools. But don't let it take away from uh, your ability to be able to get this information without them. Because you, any of these can tear up and go wrong. So, uh, you know, fall back on your anatomy and physiology and how this is supposed to work. Well, my pulse ox ain't working. Well, does he look like he's having trouble? Is his respiratory rate good? Is he hungry for air? Is his skin color good? Uh, then it's probably okay. Um, Non-invasive blood pressure is, I love my blood pressure monitors because honestly, I, I don't like taking manual blood pressures, but I do. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, great to put that on there. But your first blood pressure should always be a manual. Because in extremes, these uh, electronic blood pressures don't work. If it's very, very high, probably not going to get a good reading. Uh, if it's uh, if if your blood pressure is like uh, in the 60s, that cuff is liable to say something like uh, 200 over 100. Because what it does, it compresses against the bone. And it goes, it compresses real hard to try to find it and it can't, but you can get a bad blood pressure reading. Now, forgive me for not having this slide up, but I'll have it uh, this weekend. Uh, if you've ever taken, I know, especially on the Zoll type monitors, and sometimes I believe on some of the others, but if you ever get a blood pressure and if you notice, not all the time, but sometimes you'll have a star or like an asterisk by that blood pressure. That means that that blood pressure is an estimation. So, uh, when you see that, it could be due to movement or positioning or uh, the machine is really not sure of itself when you see that star or asterisk by that electronic blood pressure number. So uh, let your first one be uh, manual. And if the patient is critical, it's you need to probably get a couple manuals to something to go by because if you rely solely on that electronic stuff, uh, it don't have a brain and it could be inaccurate. Blood pressure, I mean, uh, uh, blood cor blood sugar determination, glucometers, they need to be checked every shift or have a routine set up to where they're checked and documented and uh, calibrated. Uh, they go bad, too. They're machines, too, especially in cold weather. If they're not kept uh, at a decent temperature, a lot of times they'll read errors. And uh, you may not get a good reading because sometimes that dried you know, when you put those tubes in and stuff like that, they're going to get they're going to get blood in them and things like that. And that blood will coagulate, get cool, and you won't get good reading sometimes. And I've seen them be off as far as a hundred, a hundred numbers before. 
So uh, one, so if they're acting crazy and it's acute or something like that, you got to remember, hey, my blood pressure machine might not be working right. So, you know, follow your local guidelines on that. I mean, ours used to be, hey, if you're wasn't sure of the glucometer reading, go ahead and give an amp a D50 because that little bit more is not going to make a whole big difference. So those are great tools. I love them. But uh, there again, just remember that they are machinery and know how to uh, circumvent that if something does go wrong. Uh, I had a medic call me one time because his electronic blood pressure cuff tore up and he was doing a transfer across the bridge to New Orleans. And he's like, I mean, I need got to get another monitor. I said, no, you get out your manual and your stethoscope and you do it that way. Uh, so, and I've been talking about reassessment. You, you can't just do an assessment and leave it along with that. There are more stories out there and I've been, I didn't do it, but I've had to investigate where, hey, the guy was taking the lady home from the hospital didn't check her the whole 60 miles, get to the nursing home. And when he gets out of the jump seat, goes around to, to get her uh, situated, she died somewhere probably 30 minutes in the trip. So reassess patients. You want to reassess after every time you do something. Even as far as like when you're spinally immobilizing somebody, you know, people can be hurt while you're spinally immobilizing. You might want to make a notation of like, hey, uh, patient had, uh, you know, he might have had severe back pain, neck pain. Uh, he had uh, distal pulses in all extremities were positive and symmetrical. The patient denied changes in sensation or motor function. Uh, after you put the spine board on, you may want to go back and reevaluate. The patient was evaluated, no change in neurological assessment, no change in this. You may want to make sure you do that reassessment to make sure nothing changed. In and out to the hospital, someone may be getting better, you know, reassess their lung sounds. People can develop pneumothoraxes on the way to the hospital or other things can happen. If that heart is in early failure, you might not hear nothing at first, but as deeper as you get into it, they can start developing that pulmonary edema and stuff. So reassess your patients. Uh, you know, it doesn't require hands-on all the time. You can sit there on the stretcher a lot of times and look at their respiratory rate and drive. You know, has it changed from earlier? Uh, and uh, reassess listening to them and things like that. So you can never really reassess enough, uh, but just be careful. It's good to have, uh, it's good to make a notation on every transport that you do is uh, that if there was any changes that occurred in route, I'll usually state, hey, the patient was transported without any change in condition or uh, events. So uh, reassess, if you're wondering if, hey, should I reassess? Then yeah, you need to reassess. If you've got to stop and think about it, then you need to do it. The, uh, this is just a recap on what we talked about earlier. Sign, the sign, size up primary assessment. Look at where your history comes in right there, pretty much after uh, primary. And I don't mean you got to stop what you're doing. You can be getting that information uh, while you're talking to a bystander or a patient. Uh, but that information is, uh, uh, it kind of helps to contribute with the course of treatment or what may have caused the event. Now, what you can, uh, and you, a lot of times you just simply cannot get that information. Uh, these conditions, sometimes this assessment, this process might have to be changed up based on what's going on with your patient. Uh, so outside your primary, remember these other events can be, it might have to be changed up a little bit. Just be able to uh, say why as to what you're doing it for. Uh, signs and symptoms. Now, a symptom is basically what the patient tells you they have. That is what they feel. It uh, That is subjective. Whatever subjective, it has to do with what the subject's complaining of or what's going on with the subject. It's what they think, what they perceive. They may be perceiving this as an emergency. And under a CMS definition, an emergency is determined if the patient thinks they're having an emergency. So it's uh, chest pain is a symptom. Tachycardia is a sign. Sign is what you observe. What do I see? Well, 
a, a pale skin is not a symptom. That's what you see. Uh, now, could it be, yeah, if you don't get real technical, I guess the patient could say, hey, I've got pale skin. Okay, yeah, you do. Uh, but sign is what you can actually see and observe, something that you can monitor. Something. Uh, nausea is a symptom. Vomiting, of course, is a sign of something you can see. So that's what we're going with from that. Uh, I don't know how most of y'all chart or anything like that. I'm not using the L chart or D chart. And the first one in the front, the L part or the D, is why EMS was called. Now, I'm kind of taking a step back from where it says chief complainant right now, but just to give you an idea. But uh, I may say, hey, emergent response, uh, 911 call of a MVC involving three cars, possible multiple patients police and fire around. I may, I may put that just to give an idea of why we were called for. And it, I even might make that note at that time ex, it, that was advised extrication may be needed, blah, blah, blah. Just, just kind of stuff like that. And then go to chief complaint, uh, neck and back pain. So that's kind of, uh, and what do I see? Well, I got some, uh, I, I see a there's a contusion on the front of the chest. The back has some tenderness, so that's the signs and stuff that I'm seeing there. So remember, chief complaint is pretty much what they say. That's why the ambulance was called. And you really should say, I've heard people say, well, under chief complaint, they'll have dyspnea. Now, like, did the patient actually say when you walked in, I got dyspnea? Uh, if, maybe if it's a medical person, they may. But for the most part, they probably said, I can't breathe. I'm short of breath. I can't get my breath. That's your chief complaint. Uh, we talk about critical thinking skills. That's effective decision making that you need to do to uh, to make the best outcome. It depends on you know experience, your ability to gather information, uh, put it together, synthesize it. Uh, how does the patient's history go along with what we're saying here, uh, and you got to get an idea. You got to form a field impression of what uh, what you think might be wrong. And remember, I told you before, you may not know what's wrong. That's when you would look at what ain't right. Uh, and this patient cannot breathe. They got congestion, uh, and they've got chest pain, and they're breathing thirty times a minute. What's wrong with that patient? Well, I tell you right now, I don't know. But what's not right with them? Okay, well, and you can name off a list of that. So that that's that that's part that's your general impression. It, it, you got to have a kind of an idea uh, of what's what's being given off to you, and uh, gathering the information. If you've been in this any time, if you've been in this one day, you know how uh, difficult that can be, and it's simply. A lot of it's based on field knowledge. And as you get more experience, you probably can look at uh, medications and see what they're uh, given for, or for the most part. Some do have off-label uh, off uses, but for the most part, that's what you're going to be doing. Gather information on how I can use this. Uh, look at the scene. Is, uh, is it, they got beer cans laying around. Is, uh, or uh, In my case, it might be bourbon bottles, but... Uh, how does the house look? Is there any medication around? Is anybody else sick? What's the overall condition of this? Is uh, looks like any violence or anything like that has happened there before? Uh, sometimes you can see like uh, home health equipment or, or like a breathing machine or something like that, kind of give you an idea that would uh, contribute to that. Is it cold? Do they have adequate heat in or cooling, hot water, things like that? Just kind of things that or you're not going to stop and dwell on a whole lot, but kind of it's like, hey, this might contribute to why she's so short of breath or uh, don't have any glass in the window. Uh, then you, you got to learn assistive prioritizing. Okay, what has to be taken care of right now that's going to change events real quick if I don't get involved and what's really not going to matter? What can I let go? What do I not have to deal with? Uh, like gout. You got severe chest pain, shortness of breath. They also tell you, hey, I got gout. Okay, probably not worrying about the gout. So learn how to prioritize your stuff with what's going on. So 
you know, you could use past experiences, things that's happened in the past. Well, the last time I saw this, it was because of here's what went on. Uh, patient, uh, elderly female sitting up in a chair, unresponsive, kind of pale, snoring, type respirations, 60 palpable blood pressure. Lay her down. She starts talking. I set her up to look at her again. She goes out. Lay her down. She starts talking. Uh, daughter come in. I said, Hey, give me the story. What happened? She said, I came in, I gave her all of her medicines. And then I went to the bathroom and she, and the, the other daughter's like, Oh, whoa, 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 wait, you gave her her medicines. Well, so did she, she got double the dose of blood pressure medicine. And so guess what was happening? Uh, and that's something that would go in. And I learned from that case, Hey, did you take your medicine this morning? Who gave her her medicines? Uh, so that's just things that's, and that just simply goes from experience of uh, being able to like divert back on things. And, you know, you've probably seen things before that, where you can take to the next call or share with another inexperienced experienced person or things that uh, may help them out. Uh, if any of y'all have uh, heard or seen any overdose patients lately, that it, from what I've heard, some of them look like they've had a black tar in their mouth or a black ink or oily type substance, and it leaves a residue. And uh, I've heard a couple of people talking about it. And I've been asking around, trying to do some research and found nothing specific with it. But uh, some of the police officers last night told me what they do suspect is people are putting black tar heroin and hash and stuff like that, smoking it. And uh, it's almost like this is not totally understood yet, but they're wondering why the patient's able to like call 911. A lot of them get scared. They get, uh, they have like severe chest pain and a cough. They'll call 911 and a lot of times they've ended up coding right in front of the team. And I, this is just me speculating since I hadn't found a lot on it. I'm just wondering if that black tar or something doesn't kind of encapsulate it or cause a delayed reaction. And when it does hit, it, it, it hits full blast. But if anybody has heard or anything like that, you know, like I said, please share it. But they said they think that's what, what it might be. And you don't know if it shows up in the one area. It's only a matter of time before it gets uh, to somewhere else. So when we talk about uh, continuing situational awareness, you know, things can change. People leave the scene. People can come into the scene. Uh, is the, the environment changing? Is it something you need to get out of yourself? So continual situation awareness, and that's being aware of your surroundings, keeping your head like a, uh, like a swivel, and uh, don't think that the scene was safe initially, that it, it's going to stay that way. Uh, information with dispatch is good to a point, and some people get frustrated because they don't get a whole lot more information. However, I think that sometimes maybe too much information can give you tunnel vision. Uh, a little information is good, and it's kind of like fire. It can either, it can help you or it can hurt you. So if you learn how to not get wrapped up in tunnel vision as far as information. Now, like you might get a patient has a history of diabetes, uh, congestive heart failure, they're unresponsive, and family can't get them awake. Well, right then you're probably thinking, okay, I'm gonna go in and get some D50 and uh, wake them up. But you know that, and it could be because if you you know don't get into the routine of uh, a structured evaluation, you might miss the point. It's like, well, today they took too much lower tab or something like that. So uh, information is good, but there again, don't let it go against you or form, uh, let you make a decision before you get there. And uh, when you go into scenes like consider information for simple, like, hey, the road system was bad this way or the road construction, is that going to be there going out? Uh, and you don't want to get caught up in that going out. Make sure that uh, persons that like going into these big fancy subdivisions or something like that, it looks like a maze that uh, you know how to get out of there. I was working a code one night and I saw the same stop sign in my rear, out my rear window four times. Uh, we kept going in circles. So all this has to do with going in, going out, trying to pay attention to those uh, hazards and um, uh, trying not to let it work against you. 
traffic of uh, I don't know, Amr Jackson just had a med former medic die because she was hit by a car a couple of years ago. Uh, getting out to help somebody. Uh, Alabama made the news here not too long ago because there was a crew. I, I don't know if it was both members or just one that was killed. I think it was on I-65. But we're all the time. You don't see this stuff on the on the main news because uh, we're not that important in a lot of people's eyes. But you do see it on like the NAMT websites or EMS one where you'll see where uh, we're hurt. You know, uh, fellow fellow EMS members are hurt on the scene. They've get uh, some's got assaulted. But a lot of time the traffic violate the traffic incidents are some of the big ones uh the you know federal highways and i think on most state highways now but on all the federal highways they have to you have to have a reflective type vest on everybody's supposed to have it police everybody's supposed to have this vest but it, you know, we're really only ones that seem like wear it the most of the time uh so be aware of uh you know, possible chemicals in the area. What, what, why did they run off the road? Did a medical problem happen before they had the incident that made them to actually have it down power lines? Uh, bystanders often have complained about why would they, the crew didn't run to the scene, man, they didn't run or anything. They just took their good old sweet time walking up there. They don't understand that perspective. And a lot of time you don't have uh, time to uh, explain things to them carbon monoxide poisoning things like that why are they four people and unresponsive in this house do we need to be going in and getting them out what caused this to happen uh secondary incidences uh are some we've read stories to where they'll have an event uh, an explosion they get the first responders in there and then a lot of times there's a secondary one to you know some ter domestic terrorism acts and things like that for it uh getting stuck getting stuck with a bad patient in the back or getting stuck trying to get to a bad patient. That's all things uh, to be considered because you don't need to go on ground that is uh, soft or wet. You really don't need to leave the blacktop if at all possible. Uh, it's hard to do in some of the rural areas. However, if you get out, those ambulances will sink. Those fire trucks or rescue squads will sink. So we need to be careful. That is all part of your scene size up. You don't want to get stuck out there with a cardiac arrest or a critical patient in the back. Uh, Anything changes with the scene safety, you're not unsafe, then you need to get out of the situation. I've left scenes before till they got calmed down. The uh, what you know what caused the injury? We're going to look at uh, was this uh, a blunt injury? Was it something that fell on them? Was it a tire or something that blew out? Did uh, you know what hurt them? How did they become in injured? So. Don't get in the habit of immediately saying, hey, this patient is trauma or medical, because a lot of time they can be both. Uh, so go up to it. It's like, OK, well, they're unresponsive. What caused this? Then that might be OK. Uh, and I've seen this happen a couple of times to where uh, when I was flying, I flew to a wreck where they said, hey, the patient's unresponsive. He's got a head injury and uh, he's combative. And uh, he was combative when we got him in the helicopter and uh, was or got him in the back of the ambulance and was taking the medic's word for it. I said, hey, man, you got a blood sugar? And he said, yeah, yeah, I got one. Uh, it was 80. So we went ahead and RSI this guy and I had a hunch. I said, let's go ahead and check it again. And his blood sugar was 20. He really didn't need all that. He The guy lied to me or uh, maybe his calibrator was off. But there again. Don't assume that somebody is strictly trauma or strictly medical. Uh, you know, it could have been a heart attack or a stroke that made them wreck. So when we defer trauma, trauma are a result of injuries that happen from outside the body. Uh, that is what's considered a tra traumatic event. It happens from outside the body, not within. Uh, mechanism is how it happened the blunt penetrating and uh basically where the injuries at can help you find underlying injuries and what other organ systems that might be involved in it now the difference between blunt trauma you can see on top is it does not break the skin it does not enter the body it can be very deadly it can it shakes and hurts everything in there 
But uh, the blunt trauma is where the body is not penetrated. And that would only make sense that what penetrating trauma is. It's when uh, the skin is broken. And with that injury on the bottom, you can't really tell how deep that goes. It looks to be, just by what I got here, it looks to be abdominal. And the reason I say that is you can see the adipose tissue. It always looks bubbly, like big clumps of fat in there. That's what it looks. That's why it looks to be an abdominal wound. It looks like adipose tissue. Probably a stab wound is, uh, you see those edges, how smooth they are. So uh, that is penetrating trauma when it breaks the skin. Now, a lot of people, a lot of medics like trauma. I don't, I don't like trauma. I'd rather deal with a medical call any day of the week. And that, uh, instead of mechanism of injury, when it comes to illness, we got what they call nature of illness. What is this call? You know, what's, uh, you need to find out about what's going on with it. You know, and the nature of this, you're making your field impression where well, it could be a seizure, heart attack, stroke, uh, a lot of times this information is gotten from your uh, chief complaint and or from bystanders or family members that might be around that actually saw what happened. So, hey, here, instead of mechanism of injury, we're worried about what is the nature of the illness for this patient. The uh, PPE is, it's, a, it's really sad that they've had to make it for it's become mandatory on even with EMS because that's something that we should have always been uh, having uh, handy to begin with. Uh, and a lot of people don't think about eye protection. I had, uh, I was like two or three people in a couple of weeks that were, had patients spit in their eyes or coughing their eyes. And they said, Hey, do we need to wear uh, safety glasses on every call? I'm like, I don't know. Do you? It sounds like you do. Cause you just don't know when that's going to happen. A lot of police departments I've seen, uh, I know some up in Tennessee and things like that, that I've watched, uh, especially in East Tennessee, because I used to watch uh, one of the cop shows on uh, Discovery or whatever channel it was, and they would put on safety glasses whenever they got out of the car. And I think they also paired as a type of camera. may be wrong, but I think that's what I was getting from that. So now you don't have to have full uh, PPE on, on every call. A lot of times it's based on what kind you're dealing with and what type of, uh, of disease you may have. Uh, is it bloodborne, airborne? Uh, but going back, talking about standard precautions, it, this assumes that all people you're dealing with have a communicable disease. And it assumes that all blood, body fluids, they don't include sweat in this, but I, I, you know, I think I would. I, I just don't like other people's goo on me. Non-intact skin, mucous membranes, it may you know, could pose a sense of uh, a risk for infection for, for those areas. A lot of blood or organisms can live in uh, fluids that have already dried. You know, HIV, you don't hang around for a long time, but hepatitis, you know, it, it does. We're still learning about how the COVID thing works. We're still not sure because it seems like, uh, for one thing, my opinion is people just don't comply like they should. So uh, that's why they're still trying to ascertain how, exactly how it's, it's spread for sure. Uh, and they can't say, well, this is not working. Well, they can't really say that because if you got to have compliance in order to determine if something's working or not. So uh, take standard precautions with everybody you come in contact with. Standard is simply the basics, uh, gloves, uh, safety glasses, uh, gown to pick, depending on what you are picking up. And it doesn't mean it has to be a COVID patient or something that's severe to put a gown on. If I got a patient that has sold himself all over, I'm wearing a gown. I don't want that on me because it could be carrying C. diff or any other kind of uh, illness that you don't want to take home. Heck, even a bad case of diarrhea, you don't want to take that home. Uh, eye protection. Now, if you're doing an invasive skill, I've seen uh, patients that were super, super hypertensive and their vessel was under pressure. And when I stuck it, it actually squirted. It actually come back and actually squirted back uh, on me. It got on my shirt, didn't get in my eyes. But that, you know, safety glasses should be worn if you're gonna if you're gonna access something that's dangerous. You need to uh, then it could splash in your eyes or your mouth. Well, you need to have a mask and gloves on. I mean, sorry, mask and glasses on. 
uh, especially if you're doing any kind of intubation or advanced airway procedure, you need to have uh, eye protection on to, to keep that from getting in your face. Because patient can cough at that last minute. If you stimulate that airway, putting in a king or something like that, they can expel something into your face, into your eyes. And, uh, you know, that's that's not good. Now, every your companies or agencies are supposed to educate everybody in these OSHA PPE regulations every year. Uh, every agency should have a policy and protocol post-exposure uh, procedure in place. But if you are, if you think you've been exposed, it needs to be reported. Those documents have to be kept on file with your agency for 30 years after you leave employment, if you're exposed. And the reason that is, is, uh, you know, some of these diseases don't show up for months or years later on down the line. And if you got a record of it, then, uh, it, it goes back to where it's still work related. But a lot of times I've foreseen people said, Oh, I didn't report it. I didn't report this. I didn't report that. Well, you come down with HIV in uh, six months and you didn't report it. Chances are they're probably not going to take care of you for it. So report everything, uh, do it in writing. If you email uh, a report, always CC yourself and uh, things like that. So just keep good records of it. Uh, we need to know immediately how many patients might be uh, affected in any event, whether it be like in a house, a chemical reaction or a wreck. Because uh, you're going to have to start making some adjustments for that. Uh, it's not always feasible to load a bunch of people back up into your ambulance. You know, where's my next backup at? Uh, where will all these patients go? It's good to have, like, a, when we get into MCIs and stuff later, uh, somebody that's in scene command can actually talk to these different, like, hospitals or other areas. Say, hey, what can you take? What can you handle? And, uh and for example, a consideration is, like, I know in our, our area, Nobody likes to deal with sick or injured pediatric kids. So that's when you're thinking, hey, uh, I've got a level two trauma center that's only uh, 20 minutes away. However, they don't have a pediatric ER, but I got a level one that's uh, 45 minutes away by ground. That's been when you like, look, let's get a helicopter in here or things like that. So those are other some things you need to be thinking about and uh, be familiar with uh, like what your local areas can handle and how many they can handle. Uh, most people that are in EMS or fire departments have to have the ICS training or NIMS training is what it used to be called. But, uh, and this training does help to kind of get a coordinated effort in place, some guidelines to follow when uh, there again, your judgment may be clouded, but it does fall back on uh, managing multiple patients, mass casualties and things like that. Uh, Some areas are going to uh, a tiered system now. I know uh, on the coast or along where we live at, up north of us, these systems are starting to include uh, advanced EMT trucks. Now, you know, what does that mean for some areas? Like if, uh, if they're way out and the patient may need more than what they uh, are able to give, do they call for a paramedic intercept or do they just continue on to the hospital? I'm not sure how that works in some areas, but, uh, you know, that's maybe something that's coming. But the request for advanced EMT classes has become pretty much pretty phenomenal right now. A lot of people are wanting to do that, you know, two thirds on the way to, to being a paramedic. And, uh, you know, I think it's a good, it's a very good initial step. So, you know, they had inter, what they called intermediates in the past. So y'all are, y'all are taking on this role again, picking up where it, it did kind of drop off because they said, well, we got a bunch of paramedics. We don't really need this now. Now they got less paramedics. They're like, hey, this is a very valuable tool that we can use to get these people trained. So that, that, that's where you are right now. So a lot of these classes are you know, still new. The material's still new. A lot of time the scope is still be written. So, you know, you're on the front line of this. So uh, finding life-threatening injuries or illnesses and manage them. That is your goal, what you what – you, uh, all about the primary survey. These, uh, you got to look for the exams, the initial assessment. Start with your ABC. It goes A, B, C, D, E. And uh, we'll get into what the rest of those are later. But you might 
well, go ahead and remember to put like an X on the front of that exanuating hemorrhage because if they're bleeding out real bad, as far as the trauma part goes, is when we get to uh, NAEMT and PHLS, it wants you to control that first. But ABC, uh, airway, breathing, circulation, deficit, uh, exposure. And uh, what you got to be careful with as far as the, the primary survey, it is not an in-depth physical exam. And it's not an assessment of vital signs. So remember your primary. If, if you're taking vital signs, you better make sure that you've cleared your, you're taking care of all your primary stuff. But uh, vital signs are in a secondary survey. And uh, when you come across, and I can't reinstate this enough, but when you come across these life threats, you got to stop and deal with them immediately right then. Because uh, once you get away from those and get back into them, you're probably going to have more than just a single problem. Now, the general impression, a little bit more broader view of that, is you're simply looking for any potential life-threatening problems. And we talk about, uh, you know, how do they look to you? Is there a work of breathing? Is there skin color modeled or pale? Does, do you see any life-threatening conditions right away? Is a so when you walk in the door and you see them that tripod position, okay, uh, they're breathing uh, 35, 40 times a minute. Do you see a problem right now? Breathing, there's a breathing problem. That's B. Okay, we're at B. Let's let's take care of B before we go any further. Why is he breathing real fast like that? You know, you want to uh, probably just point, hey, breathing fast, probably not getting enough oxygen. What are we going to do? Let's put the oxygen on. Okay, now let's check C. Okay, uh, so that, that's the way that those ABCs are handled. The uh, the skin color that I've talked about, a lot of times you'll see those signs as far as poor circulation uh, in the skin first. You know, remember your terms and know what they are. Google pictures, look at mottled skin. Look at uh, pale skin that's shunning blood or even look for flushing skin or blotchy skin in some areas. But look at those pictures to know what that what that means and what's going on. Uh, ask yourself, does a patient appear to have a life-threatening condition? How long does that take for you to do? You know, think about how long will that take for me to get to, to do? If they're sitting up and talking to you and breathing real fast, you don't see any blood or anything like that right away, okay. Uh, you know, oxygen, okay, well, I'm probably done with my primary just part. Let's get some, uh, while well, my partner's getting vital signs, I'm going to try to get some here. Uh, information. Uh, stable or unstable? How do you determine at that point if a patient is unstable or unstable? Stable means their vital signs are working. Unstable is when it's stopped working. Uh, if they've got a decent blood pressure, even though they might be breathing a little bit fast, heart might be a little bit fast, you know, they're, they're borderline stable. But when I get to the point of where the vital signs are not working anymore, if the vital signs are affected, this patient is no longer stable. Uh, when we talk about high index of suspicion, that is what, like if they're, uh, tra if it's a traumatic or anything like that, what could get worse from that? You know, these, their LOC might start to uh, worsen. They may have a bleed in their head or uh, this patient, uh, severe back pain, Cool, pale, diaphoretic. He's got unequal pulses in his arms. You know, you got to think, man, this could be, and this this could be a torn aorta or something like that. You got to have kind of a high index of suspicion of what's going on with that. Now, uh, airway obstruction when it starts to change, it's usually a lot of time because of uh, a, a change in a level of consciousness. Uh, maybe they're unable to uh, maintain their airway anymore, their tongue or something gets in the way, or it could be that because they uh, a worsening condition in the throat, allergic reaction could be smoke damage to the vocal cords where they start to swell, get hoarse. Uh, if they're talking and moving air, you know, that's good. You've got to be responsive for that. And, uh, Someone that is truly short of breath is not going to be distracted from it real easy. I mean, their cell phone is not going to cause them to suddenly start breathing normal 
while they're uh, taking the call and then go back to uh, being uh, being sick again. Now, let's talk about then the airway. If any airway problem is detected, you need to work to clear the airway as quick as possible. Uh, proper positioning, suction in the airway. Now, how long do you suction somebody? The old adage used to be, oh, only suction 10 seconds at a time or something like that, or when the patient needs a breath or uh, you need a breath, they need a breath. You suction for as long as you need to. If you've got blood or vomit that's constantly pouring into the throat, you need to suck it all out because if you, I'm going to suction 10 seconds and then I'm going to bag the rest of it down in him. That's no. You suction for as long as you need to suction to clear that airway. The uh, Any foreign bodies you see in there, you know, get them out. As soon as you see them, remove them. If they don't look like it's supposed to be there, try to get it out of the way. That, again, can cause a partial obstruction, can cause a uh, full obstruction. If you can't remove the airway with suctioning or uh, manual removal, you need to do your abdominal thrust and your chest compressions. And you do chest compressions, which is uh, you're not doing it to start the heart at that point, but you're doing it because you're trying to cross, cause so much intrathoracic pressure that you actually blow the obstruction out of the way. If you was to take a uh, empty two liter plastic Coke bottle and set a, uh, uh, ping pong ball on the top and all of a sudden squeeze that bottle, it's going to blow it off. That's, that's simply what you're doing with the chest thrust and the abdominal thrust. And uh, airway and breathing problems are really, they're, they're not the same. The signs and symptoms can overlap. Uh, airway problem simply means the air is not letting it get in. A breathing problem is a problem with, uh, you know, gas exchange. It's not providing that. They don't have structures of the chest or something can be impairing that as far as making the lungs and everything work right. Now, when they're unresponsive, uh, always consider that to be potentially traumatic at first. Rule that out. Make sure or they could have uh, fainted, which is medical, but when they fail, they hit their head and uh, now they've got a closed head injury. So think trauma could always be involved in any of it. But when they're unresponsive, immediately assess the patency of the airway. Are they able to maintain the airway? Are they snoring at all? Well, right now, that's where you're stopped at. Whether well, they've got snoring respirations. Okay, well, let's try to do something about that. I'm going to position the head. If that don't work, then I'm going to think about a, uh, a basic airway. Uh, so that's where you're starting at. Snoring, gurgling, stuff in the mouth. I'm stuck at airway right now. I'm not going any further till I get that fixed. The... Uh, Remember your basic maneuver as far as jaw thrust maneuver, as far as a, uh, you know, and this takes practice, even on the mannequins and things like that. Uh, someone with suspected uh, trauma, and that's to protect, the, you know, the head, neck, keep it in line, things like that. Uh, simple, your biggest types of instruction are simply like relax, relaxation of the tongue, uh, dentures fall back loose, blood can accumulate in the throat, uh, food, form, objects. I've got, Tobacco plugs, I've got some cigars, I've got those things out of the back of people's throats before. So manual techniques, suction, if uh, noisy breathing, bubbling or anything like that, you've got a potential blockage for, you know, where's this coming from? Is it bleeding? Is they throwing up? What's caused this to happen? The uh, These airway problems will not last long when I talk about you know, you take four to six minutes, you can start having some other problems. Sometimes these airway uh, patients that are doing that are very combative or very, uh, very active. But they'll, and if they, uh, it doesn't take them long to fatigue and go unconscious with that. So we talk about uh, look, looking at the breathing. Okay, we're past the airway. Air is going in and out. I'm sorry, let me back up. If it's not going in and out adequately, you know, you got to stop and think, is there something causing it? Is it something I need to look at and do? The respiratory rate. At this point, we're not looking for whether they're breathing 60 times a minute. We'll do that in a, in, in a moment. But right now, we're looking, is it too fast or is it too slow? You know, they look like they're panting or, hey, 
just watching them take a breath and it takes too long makes you uncomfortable, then that's uncomfortable. You need to breathe for them. So is it too fast to do any work? Is it Are they breathing too fast that uh, their respirations need to be controlled? Their fast respiration is not doing any good, then you need to get involved at that part. Uh, Cyanosis. Is what is, cyanosis, is not, cyanosis is blue. So remember the word cyanotic means the patient is blue. And that's simply because they've got blood flow. It's just there's no oxygen in it to make the color uh, correct the way it's supposed to be. Now, uh, when you listen to the lungs, what do you hear? Is it clear, full, sounds, like I said, apex, bases, axillary, anterior? Do you have all of those breath sounds in the right place? Uh, hey, Lynn. Yes. Hey, I got a structure fire. I got a Okay. All right, man. See you later. Catch you later, man. Uh, this business can be very convenient sometime, y'all. That's why we do it the way we do it. The uh, we're talking about moving air into the lungs. Now, I heard uh. A report given the other day to talk about agonal respirations. We know what agonal respirations mean. The patient's making an attempt at these respirations, but they're not working. Air is usually not moving in and out of the lungs. They may be making just jaw movement or it might make an attempted chest movement. But if air moving in and out of the lungs, if it's not moving in and out of the lungs, then you've got to make it move in and out. The uh, when we talk about a respiration or a ventilation, a complete one, that's a full in and it's a full inspiratory and expiratory cycle. So what happens here when the when the with inspiration, the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles they contract and the chest rise up and it goes out. When it when they relax, that's expiration. The chest usually returns to its normal position. And inhalation and exhalation occur in different time frames. They're varied for a reason. Inhalation it's only like it's usually like a one to three ratio. So uh, you might take uh, it might take you a half second or nine tenths of a second to uh, inhale, but when the exhale, it's extended probably twice that much, or even two to three times that long. That's why when you do artificial ventilations, that you need to allow the body to fully exhale. Every, after every breath. I and mean, you can pump a breath in fast, but you need to let it exhale completely because what that happens if you don't, that causes breath stacking. The lungs don't fully exhale air. Uh, you get just real high auto peep. And the uh, what happens when you overventilate somebody without letting it ex exhale is you cause a lot of intrathoracic pressure. It's hard for the heart to pump against it. It's also hard for... Uh, blood return to enter the chest in order to be pumped back out. So your cardiac output can drop with that. Uh, we talked about normal, fast or slow rate. The depth, well, how is it? Is it normal or is it shallow? Uh, a lot of times if it's shallow, it tends to get quicker. It can be slower if you've got some other problems going on. But this is simply, this is rapid assessment. Is it normal or is it shallow? You're making those notes to yourself. And is it symmetrical chest rise and fall? And you need to note this. I know it's about on every patient, medical, whatever. But, you know, symmetrical chest rise and fall or symmetrical expansion. Uh, is one side, uh, you know, you got to think, is one side uh, damaged? It's not working right. Could it be broke ribs or a pneumo or something causing that? Could it be that they've had a medical procedure uh, that causes this chest to be asymmetrical? The uh, breast sounds. Keep a stethoscope handy and learn how to use it. When we're doing the breath sounds, uh, like I said before, go back and forth. If you listen to the left uh, mid chest, go to the right mid chest, back and forth, just like that. And remember, with regard to the pec muscles or big breasts, you might not be able to hear everything from the front. One of the best places to hear is, like I said, where the pec joins the, the chest wall or the breast joins the chest wall right in front of the mid axillary point on either side. Great place to hear. But we got to make sure that's just one area. That's usually for the muscles are thinnest or closer to the ribs. It's one place that you can hear good breath sounds. Uh, then you need to go back and listen under the under the scapula or just below the scapula. You, listen, you want to listen to the back. You want to listen to the top. You listen to the bottom. You want to make sure it's getting in all those fields and documented such. Patient had breath 
sounds positive in the apexes and the bases. And that shows whoever, hey, man, they checked them out. Their lungs are good. So if they, uh, if something else is developed and they didn't note it, then that's something that might have developed later on for it. Now, breath sounds, you know, we're looking for the rate and the quality and the character of the breathing. Are they having to work for it? Simply state, you know, I'll, I'll state, hey, patient did not have extra work of breathing or patient did not use accessory muscles. Or you got to look at them. If they're using accessory muscles or breathing fast or if they're having problems or uh, basically real simple, if what they're doing isn't working, then you need to get involved in this. You know, the degree of distress, you know, it, it takes a little bit to start to get to the point to where you can uh, rate, you know, you rate chest pain to where you rate breathing problems. Now, uh, and there is no substitute for experience like that. So we talk about breath sounds. Uh, when we get into respiratory system and stuff later on, there's a, uh, you know, when I, I'll say, hey, I hear rails over here. And somebody else might say, well, uh, I call that crackles or there's there's a lot of variation of how people describe that. So if you feel frustrated when you're reading over it, good, because I do, too, sometimes. Uh, now. If the patient needs oxygen. At this at this step, we're never going to withhold oxygen from anybody who's having difficulty breathing now. Uh, some people say, well, their pulse ox is this. They don't need it. Or uh, they don't have their skin color is good. They don't need it. But we got to stop and think at this point, we don't have a lot of other diagnostic tools or anything like that. So if they get so much oxygen for a while at this point, it's not going to make a difference. What this is really referring to, I believe, is like COPD patients who are short of breath. And we'll talk about later. That they said, well, they live off their hypoxic drive. They get too much oxygen, so they might quit breathing. But hey, they're still short of breath, so what? If they quit breathing, we'll breathe for them. So this is just a kind of a, it's a, a golden rule: is never withhold oxygen from anyone who's having difficulty breathing. Positive pressure ventilations. If what they're doing isn't working, then you need to get involved. So positive pressure ventilations for patients who are apneic or whose breathing is too slow or too fast or too shallow. You know, sometimes it's too fast. You got to, when their patients wake and you're trying to help them to breathe, you got to coach them. It takes coaching just about every breath. That's why CPAP and stuff like that, it really only works if the patient is cooperative. That's why, uh, you know, at the critical care level, if uh, we put them on CPAP, if that didn't work, BiPAP didn't work, well, it takes cooperation for that to happen. That's when we would have to take their airway and put them down and intubate and put them on a vent. Because uh, the uh, that's therapy that's needed sometimes. There might be things going on in the lungs that the body's not able to do to where that ventilator and BiPAP and stuff takes over and allows the body to catch up. It gives them a it actually gives them a break from trying to work too hard. Working too hard to breathe is one of the most tiring things someone does, and they'll start fatiguing very fast, very early. And that's good to uh, when you catch that, when they start getting tired, if they tell you they're tired or they get that look on their face, they're not going to be around a long time. That's when I'll give the ER up. Hey, this patient has impending respiratory failure. He's still awake and alert, so they know I can't intubate him. You know, be prepared to intubate this patient. And most of the ones I've said about that, they end up getting tubes when they get there. Uh, Sometimes the patients can, uh, it seems like they're breathing adequately, but they still might remain hypoxic. Uh, sometimes with the, uh, the COVID thing, what I've seen is somebody might not really, they'll call an ambulance for no other reason other than the pulse ox is 84 or 80. Well, are you real short of breath? No, I don't feel really short of breath, but that's what my pulse ox is. So, I mean, it is possible in some situations to have someone that is breathing adequately, but they're still hypoxic. You know, of course, they're going to need oxygen. The body has learned how to cope there with it for a little bit. Now, you can see on most tests, national registry in ACLS classes and things like that, 100% oxygen is not the goal anymore. <laughs> They've said 94% to 99%. Those are numbers that you'll see throughout. So the goal for oxygenation and O2 saturation level is 94 to 99%. Uh, 
And if a patient starts to uh, have respiratory problems after you've cleared and got all the way through your survey, if they start to do it again, then you need to go back to that point and reassess everything. Maybe something that wasn't real obvious at first is there now. Maybe that pneumo got bigger or uh, maybe they're having a lot more inflammation or that, that started to develop. So be on the alert for that. Uh, if you're around fires or chemicals or things like that, some people get what they call that hot potato voice. It's like they, uh, they'll they start getting hoarse and husky sounding. And I've seen it happen to people that were had gotten out of house fires. 30 minutes later, they start like, look, man, I don't feel like, I feel like I can't swallow. And then they start getting real hoarse. So there again, keep an eye on that. And those patients do not to be, do not need to be, uh, got a refusal on or anything like that. And if it takes care of them a little bit, they need to go in and get evaluated because once that throat starts to swell at that point, uh, at the AMT level, there's nothing for us we can do for it if it closes up. The, uh, we talk about how much effort's used. Is it just uh, like taking deeper breaths or is the chest wall having to get involved? Do they start to have these intercostal uh, contractions between the ribs? Uh, you know, if you have like shallow respirations, a little movement of the chest wall or poor chest excursion, that, that, they need help. There's not a lot of air getting in and out. That's why they start breathing faster to make up for the depth of respirations or ventilations. Uh, of course, they're having deep ventilations, big significant rise and fall of the chest. And a lot of time you'll notice uh, people that are really struggling to breathe, really taking deep breaths. If you watch their heart rate, a lot of time when they take those deep breaths, their heart rate will slow down. And when they exhale, it speeds up. And that's simply the because of the big changes going on inside of uh, inside the chest. The uh, you know labored breathing can be the way somebody is sitting. Sometimes they'll tell you they're okay, but if you watch them, uh, because from a lot of times they're in denial for that. Uh, signs of these problems is uh, of course the retractions. How many words can they speak in a sentence? That's a uh, very uh, important information to note. Patient can only speak two to three word sentences or patient can complete their sentences without problems. That's notations you need to, to look at and to pass on. So uh, what is their concentration like on breathing? Is that all they're thinking about? You know, a true person that is dyspneic or having respiratory problems, they're not going to have a whole lot else on their mind at that point. They're not going to be worried about their phone ringing or uh, things of that matter. Uh, Nasal flaring, you see more in kids, seesaw breathing. A lot of this is more science in uh, pediatric patients. A wrong with the supra, uh, clavicular, and intercostal retractions, uh, especially that around the uh, where the neck joins the body, right above the collarbones, right in there, the uh, at the uh, top of the uh, typhoid, I'm not typhoid, the sternal notch, the top of that, right above where your trachea is above that, watch that. That's signs of pediatric respiratory distress when that starts to uh, get affected in that area. A uh, couple of posi positions is uh, tripod sniffing position. As you can see, uh, these kids both look sick. Look at the one on the left, his chest sunk in. Uh, he's not got a lot else on his mind right now other than breathing. You know, He really looks like he's a sick kid. He's pale. Uh, even looks like you can start to see some ribs. Of course, it's hard to tell exactly how developed that kid really is. So uh, when, when the tripod position, it, they're sitting, leaning forward, outstretched arms, uh, a lot of times with uh, head and chin thrust slightly forward. Uh, your body's doing that to kind of open the airway. It's simulating the head tilt, chin lift type message or, or, or motion. This, uh, the sniffing position, upright with the head and chin thrust uh, thrust forward. It's almost like they're trying to sniff their noses of being more prominent than the other. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference, but you just do see the more of the posi uh, sniffing position in the younger kids than you do the older ones. Uh, respiratory distress. The term for respiratory distress is when a patient has difficulty breathing. They're breathing, but it's difficult. Uh, respiratory failure is what that's what occurs when the blood is inadequately oxygenated 
or ventilation is inadequate to meet the demands of the body. And these people will start shutting down. Okay, respiratory distress is they're breathing, but they're having difficulty. A respiratory failure is in what they're doing. It isn't working anymore. They start to get fatigued, uh, gross diaphoresis, uh, level changes in consciousness. That's the difference between the two. And always remember, how do I determine failure versus distress? Even in cardiac shock, failure is when it's not working anymore, to, to put it simple. Uh, if what's supposed to happen is not, it's failing. Now, uh, the pulse rate, now, you know, stable patients, things like that, you may, you know, always palpate and actually check a pulse that it is what it says it is. Uh, some patients with certain cardiac conditions, uh, pacemakers or things like that, you know, it may not fully match what the uh, pulse ox says, or if you were to uh, monitor it on a cardiac monitor, it could be different. So always actually check the pulse for quality rate, uh, strength. The uh, circulation is uh, also related to uh, their mental status, what their skin looks like, and uh, <clears throat> The, the the overall uh, work or what they might be doing, uncomfortable, being uncomfortable, having to work just to sit there. Now, we all know how to check a pulse. Uh, big term is, is where the artery simply is nervous, uh, lies near the skin surface. And when you feel the pulse, that is a ventricular contraction. That is systole. That is uh, a systolic contraction. That is when the heart is pumping the blood. That's when you feel the pulse. Now, uh, if some of you are uh, working or anything like that and you have the opportunity, uh, you may see, like if you're looking at a cardiac monitor, you may actually see that QRS generate or that ventricular contraction generate on the monitor just a, just a very short, I don't know, half a second or second before you feel it in the, uh, feel the pulse rate because it'll get the impulse first. You get the electrical impulse and then the mechanical uh, reaction. So if you're looking at it on a monitor, sometimes you can do it with yourself. This experiment and like that is, uh, you know, you might see the QRS and then a half second or second later, that's when you'll feel the pulse rate because it's running behind it. Uh, simply how to check the pulse. You can see where it's at in the carotid. Don't check both carotids at the same time, but move up. I'll start at the wrist then go up that way to determine if I don't have one, then I'm going to go to the next one. And, uh, that's simply the way that's done. The carotid, uh, you know, you're not going to sit there forever and try to feel it. And if you hadn't felt a heartbeat in 10 seconds, then you probably need to get involved in this. So uh, there again, at this point, we're simply looking, is it there or not? Then your next thing, is it fast or slow? And then is uh, are we weak, thread, or is it strong and bounding? Those are questions that are on most of the medical reports. Is the pulse weak and thready or is it strong and bounding? So right there, you're checking uh, presence, you're, check, you're checking quality and uh, the, the effectiveness. Now, these are a little bit more challenging. Now, children, a lot of times, are not the most cooperative people in the world, but uh, A baby that is too cooperative, listless, you know, that's definitely a problem. That's when you're talking about an appearance issue. But uh, hard to feel a radial pulse in an infant, especially don't use your thumb to feel for it, but you want to look for the brachial pulse in the infant inside the upper arm, bicep on the inner side where the bicep is. Uh, <clears throat> think very basic on this. If it's not there, put it there. Not breathing, breathe for them. No pulse, put the pulse back in there for them. Uh, now, if you, uh, of course, we're getting CPR. We're talking about AEDs uh, that goes along with CPR, but if it's available, go ahead and attach it to uh, the baby. Uh, now, some of y'all will be using, uh, some states allow the AEMTs to use uh, manual defibrillators. In other words, you determine when it needs to be shocked. And other ones still might use an AED where they use those dose attenuating systems. So if you're using the manual defibrillator, the big deal there is you set the joules, you set the uh, strength 
uh, yourself. Uh, and the automatic ones, there's usually a dose attenuating system which where you hook either up PD pads or adult pads and it automatically figures it out for you how much it's going to give. Uh, for maybe if they have a pulse but not breathing, we want to stay around 10 to 12 breaths per minute for, uh, well, this is for adults too. Remember, 10 to 12 breaths for adults. Man, forever, it seemed like people just wrote down simply 20. 20, 20 is hyperventilation for an adult. So, uh, 10 to 12 breaths for an adult that's unresponsive or you're having to provide ventilations. Any more than that, you're looking at causing gastric uh, distension, uh, insufflation. Also, uh, any more than that causes the chest to become uh, like a high pressure system. More air is getting in, but then it's coming out and it causes a reduction in cardiac output. Now for uh, infants, Children, think 12 to 20 breaths a minute. Uh, there again, you want to allow in, uh, deflation of the lungs between each one, but uh, you still don't want to breathe too fast for them because it doesn't take much to damage those little lungs, and it doesn't take much to increase that intrathoracic pressure as well. Uh, and it's a shame that they have to say this, but never begin CPR or use an AED on a responsive patient. And I guess they've had to say that because you know people do. Uh, we've all heard those stories where someone collapses, people think, oh, well, we, have, we do CPR on them. Actually, we're wide awake from that. Uh, skin, there again, visually when you walk in to see that, that's the biggest indicator of perfusion on how things are going. So uh, you're seeing the circulation, perfusion, the oxygen level, body temperature, all that can be done by just assessing the skin. So color, temperature, moisture, capillary refill. Uh, temperature, are they cold, cool, warm? Or do they actually even feel hot? Moisture, are they diaphoretic, pale, are they clammy? Uh, and capillary refill. You know, it don't take long at all to do that, to squeeze the nail beds while you're doing the, uh, doing the other part. Uh, and if... Uh, or, or the palm of the hand by the thumb muscle, that's a good place to do it to see how long that that stays there. But when you're assessing that, uh, sometimes I've seen to where I, you could do it, press down, uh, blanch the area, and then let go when it stays blanched. You know, it's very poor capillary refill, becoming stagnant. So, uh, the darker skinned people, sometimes you have a problem with assessing the skin, or it's just not easily. Uh, detectable as far as color wise, that's when you look other that's when you start looking at your skin conditions, maybe your uh moisture, uh clamminess, your temperature. Uh but blood is red when actually saturated with oxygen, and it usually has uh, for light skinned people, usually has a pink type uh luster. Uh Patients with deep pig, uh, pigmented skin, changes in color. You got to look in other areas for that, like the fingernail beds, mucous membranes, lips, underside of the arm, palms, uh, conjunctiva in the eyes. And uh, as far as kids, to determine that, look at the, the palms of the hands of the soles and the feet, as far as infants and children, uh, to detect their uh, circulation, blanching, things of that matter, what their skin appearance is. Now, <clears throat> what do you see with this kid here? It looks like it's uh, it's cyanosis around the lips, the arms, not seen around the trunk or anything like that. It's almost like it's acrocyanosis. And inadequate uh, peripheral circulation will cause the skin to be different colors. Uh, pale, a lot of times lack of white, lack of ashen and gray. That usually has to do with cyanosis. Uh, and cyanosis is not... Pale. That, so you have that color. It has to be blue or gray. That's simply that's what the that's what the uh, has to do with color. And that's simply what that means. You might have to look under the tongue or the inside the cheeks or something like that to determine that in darker skinned people. Now, uh, something you might see right away is people with liver function problems. Uh, liver failure could cause them to be jaundiced, uh, yellow type skin. You might see that in their eyes. And uh, 
a big indicator to that is uh, sometimes an altered level of consciousness. Um, uh, I've seen a couple of patients at first you thought that they might be hypoglycemic or under the influence of drugs and uh, just not acting right, inconsistent with their behavior. And uh, then, you know, you look at their eyes or eyelids, it'll be yellow and it could be some like acute liver failure. There was some uh, meth that went around here for uh, a few years ago and it was killing people, putting them into liver failure. And uh, that's what a lot of people do. They'd get real agitated, real upset, real easy. Confusion. A lot of people would call because this person was confused. And when you get there, they can get to the point of being combative. But we'd learn to like look at your eyes and stuff like that. It wouldn't be jaundiced. And uh, a lot of them died. But there was no way to reverse it. Uh, now, I, I described the skin temperature a little bit earlier. Hot, cold, cool. That's in uh, a lot of the reports as well. So you want to get a good idea with what that is. These thermal thermometers, it is great to take the uh, temperature on a patient. We, we need to do that now. We're used to it wasn't always so mandatory, but just be aware that sometimes you're not going to get real adequate readings with some of the people we see because they might be out in the elements and things like that. And it takes a while for them to warm up. Uh, now, capillary refill time. The, uh, We've all learned the different areas to put that in there stuff. But this is, a, as far as kids especially, is one of the biggest indicators of adequate perfusion. Uh, and this is the measurement of how fast that the circulatory system can restore blood after it's been pushed out of an area. It's simply refilling an empty vessel type thing. Uh, pediatrics, it's pretty reliable. Capillary refill in an adult, it's really not relied on much, as much as it is on the kids because, because you can a lot of time assess pressures and things like that more readily on an adult, whereas you can a kid. Uh, like it might be difficult to feel a, a peripheral pulse on a child if they're in severe trauma or shock because everything's being shunted to the inside, so uh, they're not going to lose their capillary refill. Their systems are so compact and tight. Of course, in adults, you know, capillary refill is not that big of, a, of an indicator for it. Uh, this capillary refill time can be aggravated with uh, other conditions that might be going on with this patient. For example, like, uh, you know, exposure outside, pre-existing medical conditions, a history of being a smoker, because uh, it does cause peripheral uh, blood vessels to... Uh, lose oxygen carrying capability and they do develop uh carbon monoxide and things like that in those areas the uh capillary refill it should be prompt and uh less than two seconds is what we like to see so you need to know was it prompt less than two seconds or was it brisk did it come back right away so uh Anything more than two seconds is bad with those other considerations in place. But there again, if, uh, you need to actually make a good feeling of that, evaluate it. And even if you get a good one, you need to recheck that and follow up, make sure nothing else that is happening. Now, uh, we're getting into disability, which is ABCD. I one. Well, I ain't got the disability yet. Uh, bleeding, it has to stop. It all will eventually stop on its own. So what we're going to do is uh, when you need immediately notified or are aware of external bleeding, and it's got to stop. You know, direct pressure. Then on the extremities, you got to think: is your tourniquet and everything ready? Where is your? Uh, you know, you go into a trauma call, part of your situational awareness. You're going to have to get this stuff ready, ready to go. Now. Uh, it needs to be easy access. I hate how sometimes they lock up in cabinets and wave they're in the bottom of the bag. That's something that you can take care of when you're doing your uh, check off and things. You got to have immediate access to it to control hemorrhage. It doesn't take long at all. A uh, couple, three minutes, someone can bleed to death with a, a torn IVC or a torn uh, a femoral artery. So look for evidence of bleeding. Do you see it? Do you see blood squirting, squirting anywhere? Is it on the clothes or anywhere underneath them? Uh, now, you know, arterial blood is going to squirt 
and probably project, but venous blood, continuous steady flow, that can be deadly as well. Uh, direct pressure with the gloved hands, throw a bandage over the wound, and most of the time we'll take care of it. Uh, major bleeding on extremities, uh, right away you might need to start going to a tourniquet or like that if it is uh, that bad. We'll talk more about that in trauma. So uh, if the patient has problems with circulation, remember, if there's something wrong with it, we're gonna try to put it back there to the best of our ability. If, uh, how does that mean? How are you gonna restore uh, blood in these, or restore circulation? So first off, we gotta stop the bleed. Now, years ago, we used to think that the quickest you could put IV fluids back into somebody that, you know, that we had done something. Well, we got their pressure up. We went from 80 to 100 now, and uh, we've got four liters of fluid in there. So, uh, and that's all they would talk about, good fluids, good blood, which they need all that. However, a lot of, you know, the tourniquet situation just come back about six, seven years ago. Before, you know, that was used to be a last resort. Now they're moving to the top of the line. And one of uh, the trauma surgeon's thought process was, it's like this, if you're sitting in a bathtub, and uh, you're filling it up and you got to constantly let the, you know, and you got a leak in it, you got a hole in your bathtub. What makes more sense? Plug the hole or do you keep pouring water into it? So that's kind of the same thing that we're doing here. So uh, that's what, if they got hemorrhage. Otherwise, if the circulation is not there, you got to think about doing chest compressions, CPR, no problem, AED. Uh, the one reason they may have uh, no cardiac output is such a disorganized heart rhythm uh, being in uh, VTAC or VFib and have to be converted out of it. So uh, at that point, any patient that is on, uh, if resuscitation is in progress, they need to be on high flow oxygen, regardless whether it's BVM or a uh, non rebreather. Now, after C comes D, disability. What are we looking for then? You're looking for, you're gonna do actually two or three steps in neurological evaluation as you'll learn. But right now we're simply trying to learn just an overall level of consciousness. Uh, you know, are, the, uh, are they unresponsive? Do they respond with an altered LOC? Are they respond with an unaltered LOC? Are they confused, alert? Are they able to come, uh, to carry on a conversation or ask questions like that. So uh, sustained unresponsiveness indicates a critical respiratory, circulatory, or CNS problem. And these patients need to be gotten to definitive care immediately. That's not something you want to stay and play with. Uh, start your resuscitative measures to get them on the way to the hospital because at this point, it's probably something a lot deeper than what uh, any of us is able to deal with. Uh, you know, why do they have the altered LLC? It could be inadequate perfusion or just oxygenation problems. It's not getting to it. The uh, first thing you'll see is a change in the loss of a change of level of consciousness altered when it starts having those problems. That's going to be the first big indicator that something else is going on when you start seeing that. The next thing you might start seeing is respiratory rate increase or an increased heart rate. So uh, that's your first signs. Don't wait till the pressure stops. Also, you got to think about is there drugs or alcohol involved, any type of uh, alcohol poisoning, chemical imbalances, neurological conditions, either hypoglycemia. Every altered LOC needs to have the blood sugar checked, every one of them. Uh, I've seen a lot of seizures and sometimes strokes be activated to get to the hospital, and they you get there, and uh, it was a glucose problem. So anybody with an altered LOC, they need to uh, have their blood sugar checked as uh, quick as possible. Now, when you evaluate mental status, you know, you're looking for, if they don't wake up and look at you, you know, tap them, hey, does it, uh, do they respond then, or if you have to do uh, pain to orientate it, or to, to get them a response. Let's say I shake somebody, they got their eyes closed, I shake them, and they look at me, okay, that's verbal, and I start asking them questions. They're either altered or they're not. Uh, at that point, we're not looking at a big detailed part about it. It's like, okay, this patient is confused. He don't know what happened. 
So we know right then he's got a problem. Let's go. We need to go. Uh, so let's talk about spinal mobilization. Now, a lot of places have gone to this restrictive spinal type of uh, protocol. And the reason being, we was man, we was mobilizing way too many people. I remember we would somebody would sneeze too hard. They'd want you to put a backboard and spine board on them. We did that with everything, just about everybody. I found out it caused a lot of damage sometimes. A lot of uncomfort, a lot of skin wounds, a lot of pressure sores and things like that built up with it. So uh, we're talking about the need for spinal, uh, for spinal mobilization. Go back to thinking, saying why. Why am I doing this or why am I not doing it? Uh, a lot of people don't like to mobilize people. Like I said, I'd rather not do trauma. But if I have to, I will. However, uh, well, how do I know if I need to use the spinal board or C collar and stuff or not? If you got to stop and ask yourself that, then you probably need to use it. So, uh, the uh, indications for spinal mobilization is a mechanism of injury that indicates possible spinal or potential spinal injury. You know, they got hit in the head, they got hit in the back. Uh, they were thrown for 50 feet. Uh, if you've got pain or palpate, uh, pain or tenderness, when you uh, examine the neck or the spine, that's indications for spinal immobilization. Uh, neck and back pain, and of course, a big one, par paralysis or neurological complaints. If uh, they have any of that, then yes, by all means, immobilize. Uh, Document what was there before and document if there was any changes or not after. Uh, priapism. A lot of times happen with lower spinal injuries where, uh, and the way that works is uh, for your for your nervous system to elicitate a positive response. And in this case, vasodilate, vasoconstriction, it doesn't want the vessels to dilate too much because it can make blood pressure drop. So your body is constantly telling your vessels to dilate or not violate. But for the most part, to maintain posture, upright position and things like that, it's going to say we're not going to dilate. Now, what happens a lot of times with priapism is uh, and that's uh, you know, uncontrolled erection that happens from trauma or sometimes it can happen from certain drugs. And that's simply where that part of the nervous system loses the stimulus of not staying but the blood vessels staying contracted and they open up, allow blood in, and then they get uh, get the priapism. That's where that, how that starts and how that works. They need to be immobilized, of course. And of course, blood trauma with any of the following, like uh, altered uh, level of consciousness, intoxication or difficulty or inability to communicate, because what that come back to is they, are they going to give you a, 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 a correct story? Now, if I was going to go up, I see somebody ambulatory to seen, they're walking around, low mechanism of injury, and uh, like, sir, does your neck hurt? You need to ask that first. I've had people say, uh, hey, can you move your head around? Well, if it hurts, you don't want to move it around. Well, hey, sir, does your neck hurt? Does your head, neck, or your back hurt? Well, hold on just a second. Uh, that might be, hold your head still for me, please. And that's when you want to start palpating and uh, uh, get more in depth. Now, Let's say you go up to them and you say, hey, sir, does your neck hurt? No, it don't. Can you move your head backwards and frontwards and up and down? Yeah, I can do that. Does that hurt? Well, if it hurts, then they need to, if it hurt because of uh, a provocation, that's, that's a producible injury, then they probably need to have at least a seat collar on. But if they move it back and forth all around, I said, no, that don't hurt at all. Then these people probably do not need a uh, spinal mobilization. But there again, if you got a question or if you got doubt, then uh, be able to do which one you can say why and uh, be able to back it up. Now, the AVPU, you're going to see a trend of them probably getting away from that before long. Uh, they just, a lot of places don't like it, and they s say that it's really not reliable because uh, 
if I walk into a room and someone has their eyes closed, are they awake? Are they asleep? Are just closing their eyes? Are they unconscious? So you see where that might be like, well, wait a minute. They, you just walk in and woke them up. That's what happened. So that's where they're kind of really confusing that with and why you want to go more toward a GCS. But simply you walk in, it's a good note to make. Hey, are they awake and alert? No, they're not looking around or anything. I holler at them. They look at me or I go tap them on the shoulder, pinch them. Then they look at me or, hey, they're not responding at all. That's simply what that's for. Uh, orientation tests is, uh, you know, you may want to ask them. I'll ask them stuff like, hey, where were you going? Or do you know where you are? Do you need to, uh, uh, can you tell me what your address is? Even though you, you look at their license or something like that, can you tell me where you live at? So you're at this point, you're trying to de determine whether they're uh, confused uh, to that point. So if, uh, you know, people probably say, hey, you always hear alert and oriented times three, alert and oriented times four. That's really not what people want you to say anymore for the simple reason. Uh, what is times three? What is times four? Well, we got a pretty good general idea. A lot of times people say it's person, place, time, and event. But it's not like that all the time. So I'd be literally saying about whether well, alert and oriented times four. Or if you say, hey, they're alert and oriented times three, I'm saying, okay, which three? Which one are they not? Uh, Glasgow Cone Scale, that is the best way to kind of give an idea and track responses. Your size points to, uh, you know, there, is their eyes open? Are they able to talk to you? Can they follow commands? This is a, commun a commutative uh, response. Now, what is the difference between, uh, now you've probably heard of, uh, some people call it Glasgow comma scale or a Glasgow comma score or just overall GCS. Now, scale, Glasgow comma scale is, is when you put all the numbers together. So you, you can say, uh, I've got a Glasgow comma scale of four, five, six for a Glasgow comma score of 15. That's just determined. I don't think that's anywhere you required material to learn. It's just good information to know. Uh, if you want to challenge somebody one day, just give them a trivia kick. But like I said, uh, and they may have like three, a Glasgow comma scale of three, four, six for a score of, you know, like 13. So that's the way that that would, uh, that would work in that case. But be careful with uh, oriented times four or times three because that can be determined uh, differently. The, uh, it's just simply how to inflict, you know, you don't want to go up and actually hurt somebody and cause harm. They call it painful. But you see they're doing here, pinching the earlobes, pressing these pressure points on the eyebrows or that trapeze or that sternocleidomastoid muscle on the side of the neck, the eyebrow pressure, something like that. Or what I've seen some people do is grab a finger and pinch over the nail bed, and that will elicit a response without really hurting them or anything. The uh, you got to be able to find what you're looking for. Rapid full body scan is simply you got to take a look, look at the front, and when you roll them up, look at the back. So many times things have been missed uh, sticking in the back because people simply didn't roll it up and look at it. Uh, kind of. Uh, and those of us that are transporting, if we get on scene and uh, the first rescuers there have put somebody on a backboard, they, uh, you know, that they really look at the back and find anything wrong with it. You know, how reliable is that relationship? You know, you hate to roll it up and look again, but just, you know, beware uh, you know, that there could always be something in the back. Oh, hey, did you look at the back? Oh, no, we didn't look at it. Well, you need to look at it. And you need, even if it means uh, undoing stuff, rolling them up and looking, because you don't want to go in there with uh, that knife in the back or that blade in the back or something like that, because you'll hear about it for a long time if you do. So look for things. Look for gunshot wounds. Look for stab wounds. If you don't look for it, you're not going to find it. So uh, it's, you know, you're, at this point, you're simply looking for things that are not right. You're looking for the negatives as much as the positives, but simply 
I'm looking for things that are not right. After you expose them, you, you know, you need to cover them up, cover them back up, be, be uh, vigilant about it. You don't want to do it out in front of the opening or something like that. Get them back of the truck, get away from the crowd. Think about it, if it was you or your family. Uh, but patients have the tendency to get cold very, very quick. Uh, one of the most important pieces of equipment that you can have on an ambulance is a blanket. Make sure that you got them. If you've been outside the last couple of days, it's pretty nasty cold out there. And I know it would just think about if that's what you had to be subjected to. Uh, I transported to a nursing home last night that they wouldn't let us come inside. It's literally 29 degrees with 20 mile an hour winds. And they wanted to bring their stretcher out and change her outside. I'm like, oh my God. But anyway, uh, that patient was so cold. I felt so sorry for her. So cover them back up after you look. Make these uh, notations that what you find to, uh, like if you're handing off to a helicopter crew or another crew, be sure you note those findings uh, th that you can pass them on to it. So and if they find something that you didn't, you know, just talking up to a good learning experience. Now, when you look for abnormalities, that's called the inspection. Then you're going to do uh, palpation. You're going to touch and feel for abnormalities. Not only do you look at the neck and check for things, but you want to palpate and feel if anything actually happened to where they got some deformity, uh, step down problems, issues, or anything like that. The uh, auscultation, listening to the body sounds with a stethoscope. Now, do you, you know, breath sounds that should be checked. I mean, uh, that, that, that's your basic requirement. That verifies breathing, how breathing status is working. Now, do you listen to bowel sounds or any other thing? Now, it's good to listen to heart sounds too. And, you know, there's a lot of sounds the heart makes that a lot of everybody's going to pick up on, but it's kind of, uh, man, that sounds weird. Or, you know, you know what a normal heart sounds like, don't you? So when you hear an abnormal one, you're going to think, that sounds weird. I wonder why that is. And, uh, you know, hand it off to tell the receiving person about it. And they may say, oh, this person has uh, aortic stenosis. And then you're like, dang, okay, well, now I know what that sounds like. Or they may have uh, a mitral valve prolapse. That's what you heard. Okay, well, now I know what that sounds like. Uh, bowel sounds. Now, a lot of times when somebody's in shock or got a major uh, pretty serious issue with the digestive system, a lot of times it quits moving. It quits digesting, and a lot of time you'll have absent bowel sounds. Uh, but but you have conditions where they may be uh, like, you know, have a real bad diarrhea or something like that, then the gut, of course, is going to be very, very active. And uh, so if you listen to them, like with trauma, blunt trauma, things like that, uh, you may want to say, hey, they, they don't have any bowel sounds or any other type of illness, if they're complaining of abdominal pain, it's a good idea, or anything to do with the abdomen, it's a good idea to go ahead and assess that abdomen and uh, make notes of it. Now, DCAP BTLS, I got to look at it because I don't remember it. This actually, this mnemonic came out years after I got into this. Now, I was always looking for this stuff. I just didn't have it memorized in that great little mnemonic like that. So, uh, deformities, contusions, what are the differences? You know, what is a contusion? What is an abrasion? Know these terms, uh, be able to describe, describe it. Lacerations, swelling, uh, know these terms and be able to uh, describe them and know what might be caused of them. Now, punctures and penetrations, what's the difference? If it breaks the skin, you can call it whichever one you want. Uh, deformities. Now, it's uh, let's just get technical here for the heck of it. Is swelling deformity? You know, if you stop and think about it, well, it does look deformed. It's swollen. Uh, is the is it is the deformity due to swelling, just fluid, or could there be something broken there? Sometimes you not be real able really to tell. In that case, I would put swelling slash deformity, and I might even note whether it was hard deformity or soft deformity. And what I mean by that, well. I felt of it, the leg is really swollen, so it kind of deformed, but it's not hard. It didn't feel like bones or crepitus or anything like that. So kind of note those two differences uh, on there. Uh, okay. 
thing if I go over here. All right. Only a few conditions cause sudden death. I was thinking about what they could be. And that's anything that has to do with those the big three, the ABCs. Uh, that's why they call them vital signs. Anything that happens with those, I know vital signs, like we talked about the blood pressure, but when you talk about these, these vital life functions, breathing, airway, and circulation, those three things, anything happened to those, that's an immediate life threat. Uh, so we're looking at for life threats. First observation, a lot of times they can be extremely anxious, followed by uh, like a loss of, uh, like, if you will, meaningful communication between you and the patient. That's why I ask them something uh, that should be obvious. Even though it sounds crazy at first, to, it may be sound crazy at first. Like, sir, what kind of car were you driving? Well, dude, I'm sitting right here. And, you know, it's a Trans Am. Uh, you know, if, if things seem to change a little bit, ask them again. Hey, what kind of car are you driving? Or uh, ask them again, where were they going? Uh, and uh, something that you that you know that they might should remember later. You know, ask that same question again. It doesn't have to be any certain type of question. It just kind of helps you to track what's going on. Uh, being anxious, they call it like a feeling of impending doom or, you know, like what's wrong? I don't know. What's wrong? I, I, I don't know. Uh, well, that's anxiety. That is anxiousness. Anxiety is a form of, is called uneasiness without being able to pinpoint the source. That's what happened with a lot of behavioral anxiety. What's going, you know, there are people who are upset, they're anxious. What's wrong? I, I'm not sure. I don't know. I can't put my hand on it. So be alert of that. Uh, the uh, you know, and sometimes loss of conscience can be immediate, or sometimes it can develop over a little period of time. Uh, the vessels in the depending on what type of vessel in the brain or something was injured, whether it be a slow bleed or a fast bleed, uh, how fast is that dissecting uh, aneurysm or dissecting aorta? How long is it taken to completely done? Uh, Sometimes with a head injury, someone will have uh, clamped down like jaws, uh, Christmas, if you will. And if that suddenly becomes slack or lax, you got to think about, well, this patient's crashing. Now you got to start worrying about airway obstruction. So these are things that that take place pretty much quicker than you can uh, you can head them off. That's when we talk about these identify these uh, life threats. Do I need to get involved in this? Uh, but after like a, a level of consciousness starts to take to kick in, uh, they become less responsive to external stimuli. Uh, start getting into respiratory issues with that. Then could be cardiac issues, and uh, it causes a big myriad to uh, turn around. Uh, kids will do this pretty quick. Uh, kids will crash on you very quick. I've seen. Uh, a 10 year old that we were flying go from uh, a heart rate of like 140 to a systole and right at one minute uh that's how fast he decom he decom decompensated so quick we could hardly even keep up with it there again you might not know what's wrong but just remember what's right just kind of fall back on that part so uh determining uh transport now Taking a good look at them, getting a good general impression can give you a good idea. Hey, we need to start going now. We need to get out of here. We can't we can't wait around. I'll do the rest of my assessment in the ambulance because, you know, they, pro they probably need, if what they got's not working and what you got's not working, then they need to be got somewhere to where hopefully somebody has something that'll work on these patients. That's when we're going to say, hey, we're going to get these out of here. So rapid scan, hey, this ain't right. They're breathing 30 times a minute. They're breathing 40 times a minute. You've got a you've got enough information right there to go. The uh, things that would uh, cause a high priority patient, of course, difficulty breathing, 
any type of serious mechanism of injury, don't wait till it gets bad, but hey, they just got, they just fell down 30 flights of stairs or uh, they just got knocked off that horse while it was running full speed. Uh, poor general impression, man, this guy looks sick. I mean, if it makes you sick to your stomach when you first see it or and I ain't talking about wigging out or nothing, but if you say, hey, this patient is sick, that is your general impression, a poor general impression, then it's time to go. Mental status changes, severe chest pain, problems with skin. All of these are signs of, you know, ABC issues. Complicated childbirth. There's one, you know, lots of time. It has to be got to a place that can that be taken care of. You don't need to spend a lot of time on scene with this at all. Uh, very, very, can be very challenging call. Uh, of course, uncontrolled bleeding. You know, there's a saying that all bleeding will always stop, but it may be after the patient died. That's, uh, I forget who says that, but uncontrolled bleeding. That sometimes it's easier to control the uh, bleeding in the extremities, but what if it's, uh, you know, junctional bleeding or bleeding to the abdomen or the chest or even internal bleeding? Nothing you're going to be able to do about that in the field. Uh, people that are responsive but unable to follow commands, they uh, may be awake and looking at you. Had one exactly like last night. Uh, he would look at me and uh, he would follow me with his eyes, but he could not do anything that I asked him. It turned out, uh, be a problem in the in the brain so uh severe pain in any area of the body now uh a lot of people play off pain everybody's not a seeker or playing to get pain medicines so severe pain in any part of the body uh according to the guidelines that we're going by that is a determined for a priority dispatch or the inability to move any part of the body paralysis or uh Something that is hampering motor movement, that is a high priority, of course, as well. Now, uh, scene time can get away from you so quick. That's why, uh, you know, you, th you think you've done real good. You know, you, you feel good. Hey, I got this patient packaging off the scene, and you look at your clock. It's like, man, it's been it's been 18 minutes or 20 minutes. It's like, how could it be that? You know, and it gets by quick. Uh you know, it, it takes practice, but it's very, very easily to get distracted out there. And what happens a lot of time is people's judgment gets clouded or they get distracted. And the reason they get distracted is they kind of drifted away from the training. So remember, that's why it's good to have an organized plan when it comes to patient assessment, carrying this stuff out. So we want to, people that are sick and need transport, little as time as possible on scene. Uh, you know, the golden rule, what they want to use is 10 minutes or less on scene not always possible it could be other things in consideration like uh extrication or uh crowds or power lines on a vehicles that all that would change that however that would be outside your control uh if uh you're working in a system to where you're on a advanced emt truck and there's paramedics are close by or whatever, then you may you know, think about getting the, uh, the paramedic level assistance in route, or maybe they can meet them and meet them on the way, uh, getting a rendezvous viewpoint. Now, as far as uh, giving the fluids, uh, the King Airways and things like that, you know, you guys have got that as AEMTs, but this patient may need, uh, you know, you might recognize, hey, this patient has a tension pneumothorax. I need somebody, you know, I'm still 25 minutes out. Can a paramedic get me, meet me? You know, that's, Part of your consideration because uh, they may need to be decompressed they they won't last that long uh, <clears throat> so don't be if you give uh don't be falsely reassured or overly reassured by vital signs that return to normal or appear normal that uh if you got all this other stuff going on with normal vital signs like i said don't let that don't let your guard down because of that because those could uh it could be that they're just compensating and it sneak up on you or if uh i don't know why somebody would do this but they might be transporting priority one because their pressure was 80 over 40 and you give them a liter of fluid now it's 100 and you're like okay let's stop we can turn everything off now you know you know don't be falsely reassured because the vital signs get better a lot of time with trauma they will not stay that way uh Again, look back at the MOI, think about the MOI mechanism of injury. Could there be something that I missed? Like a patient is complaining of left hip pain 
he's complaining of left hip pain, left side pain. However, uh, he was sitting on the right side of the car. So I need to look on that side for injuries as well because his left side injuries may be distracting him or uh, calling him away from uh, uh, what, what's on the right side. Uh, understanding the mechanism of the injury, how it might affect the body, that is, uh, it's going to give good information to the hospital staff. And uh, if you can ref like refer your text to table three, you can have some good pictures and things like that in there for you as far as uh, discerning those type of injuries. Now, history taken, uh, that can be done with uh, a couple of different ways as far as getting it from the family or what you see. Maybe the patient can talk. But first, after your chief complaint, uh, you need to try to get as much history as possible from people, if at all possible. And uh, that, that, that's going to be related important after all. Now, you don't like getting calls with limited information and uh, not given to you so and when you don't really have well nobody you know you think about it, you're going to call nobody can tell you anything you know what do you have to work with you kind of like okay well i've got to uh, do some investigation and uh, go from there so as much as possible as you can get from them uh if they got id tags or paperwork on them uh maybe from a recent hospital uh visit uh but however, like I said, if they're, but if they're unstable and you can't really stay around and wait for that and just like, look, I couldn't wait any longer. They were sick. That information was not available. Simply just ask that information was not available. I don't have it. Uh, when you're able to get information, things that you need to look at, of course, demographics, we all need that. Stuff that you really ask for all the time anyway, age, race, sex. Uh, now, and I don't want nobody to be offended by this, but you know, race and sex some more. There's they've added a new column to that to where it says unknown. Uh, I'm not going to if I can't tell. Obviously, I'm not going to ask them what what are you. So, but that goes into statistics and it does have some factors with the way some conditions uh, conditions present. So, just be a, alert of that. Uh, past medical history, current health status. What are they doing now? Are they seeing a doctor now for anything? And uh, pertinent family history. The reason I say that is a lot of times someone that has uh, heart attacks or strokes or problems in their like 40s or 50s or 30s, you can bet pretty much they're going to have a close relative that had the same thing happen to them. Uh, recent travel history. Uh, when I worked at Gulfport, we got a lot of tourists in, a lot coming from planes and stuff like that. And uh, there was... Uh, And there was a virus, you know, I'd say a stomach virus, gastrointestinal thing come in on a plane one time. And uh, th there for a few days, they had asked people, did you travel on this flight? Or did you travel from this country? And uh, they had gotten some E. coli at the airport. So that was just some simple, maybe some type of a comparison type of question. Now, uh, chief complaint. Sometimes people get offended or asked, uh, upset of about when you're asking them questions so just bear in mind of that because i've had uh i had a guy get mad one time because i asked him i said hey uh what made you call the ambulance he said i'm having a stroke and then i said well what makes you think it's a stroke and you know i could see where that would be challenging his decision but maybe a better way i could put that is like well what kind of stroke signs are you ha having or what kind of symptoms are you having that make you think that uh Ask simple, open-minded questions. This is not the time to impress with big words or anything like that. Uh, you want to, I hate when somebody doesn't pay attention to me, like when I'm talking in an interview or stuff like that across the desk or wherever it is. Uh, so think about your family. How would you want to be treated at this point? But use eye contact body position. You don't want to be threatening. You really don't want to overstand them with your hands crossed because that kind of like, hey, you know, what would you bother me for? Uh, body language sometimes says more than what people actually speak. But the uh, allow the patient to talk. Try not to interrupt uh, when they are uh, telling you about what's going on. 
sometimes you got to goes back to hand of control when we start going off on a tangent and then uh if it's getting away from what's going on with the call then you need to redirect it but as long as it's about to call or what's happening okay then you kind of need to take it in uh think about symptoms and problems or feelings uh what the patient reports to you what signs can you be seen in front of it can it be heard felt smelled or anything there that you can actually put your hands on so uh they're breathing are they are they dys dyspneic so you know it's sometimes it's, you really can't get a good answer from them like what they'll just tell you i don't know i just don't feel good i mean you know how do you handle that that's when you start looking for your clues or has anybody else felt that way and sometimes you just may not get a good chief complaint on these patients uh OPQRST. This is after you, you know, you got your secondaries, maybe on the way to the hospital at this point, or you're, uh, you know, your life threats are been taken care of. So, some questions you need to ask is, uh, you know, what time did this start? How long has it been going on? Uh, did it come and go? What were you doing when it started? Does anything make it better or worse? Kind of like uh, abdominal pain. Does anything make it better or worse? Well, can you move your legs? Does that make it hurt? When you sit up, does that make it worse? Does it make it better? Does it make it easier? So you're looking for the provocation or palpitation. What may what may seem to to uh, make it worse? Now we talk about quality. That's their description of pain: location and focal or diffuse. So remember where your organs are, your body regions, and things of that matter. Uh, you don't want to ask leading questions. Uh, for example, try to uh, make them answer a question that you want, how you want it answered. For uh, you might want to say, well, where else is you having chest pain? Does it go anywhere else? You know, you could ask it like that. Does it hurt anywhere else other than your chest? You want to say, does it run down your left arm into your hand? You don't want to ask. Put, they'll, they'll probably say, yeah, yeah. And then you can ask them, what does it make your teeth itch? Oh, yeah, yeah, it does. So, I mean, just be careful with questions like that. So, uh, when we talk about quality, their description of the pain and, and how it feels. Uh, Sometimes I've asked them, well, what would you do to make me feel that way? And I've had them tell me so much, well, I would put a shovel through your back or something like that. I mean, it's just, it's just kind of, uh, it does a couple of things. It shows them that you're, you know, you're kind of appreciate what you're going through and you're, you're kind of seeing how they describe it back to you because you've got your being medically trained. You've got your idea of how this should feel probably, but however, let them try to explain it back to you as much as possible. And, uh, the patient's own words, that's very important. Like, uh, you know, how, you know, how does this, sir, how does this feel? Can you describe it to me? Man, it feels like I'm sitting on a cold piece of iron or, uh, you know, I would probably put that in quotations to describe that because uh, some people just they're not able to describe things accurately. Uh, you figure if someone has, we talk about focal pain. If you ask them where it hurts at, or put, I usually say, hey, can you put your hand on it for me? And a lot of times, and they probably do it without thinking, but sometimes they'll take like focal pain and they might point to it with a finger or like lay one hand on it or something. But a lot of times when they describe uh, diffuse pain, a lot of times they'll use, they'll flatten their hand out. And it's just kind of uh, something I've noticed. It's kind of like a, maybe they're doing it unconsciously, but it's kind of the way they express it. But you can say, where exactly does it hurt? And they'll take a finger and point or either like if they lay their hand on it across their abdomen or across their chest or their back, a lot of times it describes diffuse pain. Now, and of course, the radiating pain, Sometimes you'll see that with chest pain where it's, well, it starts here, but I can feel it in my arm and it goes all the way down to where my hand is or sometime in the abdomen. You know, I'm hurting, uh, I, I really hurt bad around my belly button, but, uh, man, I can feel it up into my back as well. That is what we call uh, radiating pain. It doesn't stay still, it goes somewhere else. So, uh, 
a little bit of uh let's cut to, let's dissect these little these words a little bit better uh talk about radiating pain that pain can be tracked traced from one area to another it's kind of like it hurts in my chest a lot of time they'll say and it goes down through my arms uh sometimes when they describe referred pain that's usually pain that's in more than one place like uh i'm hurting uh I really hurt around my belly button, but it go it goes through to my back and uh, up under my shoulder blades. So that's kind of like the pain exists in more than one area, different places, maybe the same, but the radiating pain usually is where it kind of travels or leaves a trail to another place. Then we got to ask about uh, how bad is the pain? Can you rate it? Now we've got the pain scales, we've got the face pain scale. We got the uh, numeric, which sometimes is not really all accurate. And some people, everybody describes their pain all the time. Well, what is it on a scale of one to 10? Well, it's a 20, it's a 20. Well, that's when I might start looking at the face scale or how easily are they distracted from this? And uh, so be alert for that. Now there's other pain scales out there that you use for like uh, infants, or patients that have that are sedated or unconscious there's pain scales out there called the flak scale and some other things like that and uh we're really not going to use them in this uh in this arena but uh it's not a bad thing you're going to google it and look at it but that's what like how they would determine if a, how a baby's hurting and stuff like that now a face scale for a baby it's not really reliable figure a baby's hurting you're going to scream so uh but this other scale would break it down a lot more, but it's a little bit more complicated. And it's not something you can really have by memories. You gotta have the chart to look at it. What has this patient done before you got there? Did they take any medicine? Any, do they have active chest pain? Was it lead by anything? Did they put yourself on the oxygen? Uh, sir, how much aspirin have you taken? No, I took one. How big? It was 81 milligrams. Well, you know, the dose is 324. Sir, I'm gonna go ahead and give you three more of these baby aspirin. And explain to them why like, oh you're trying to kill me you're trying to overdose me or uh if someone's already had the adequate amount of uh, stuff then you really don't want to give them any more on top of it uh like nitro well, sir i've had six nitro in the last 10 minutes well you definitely don't want to probably come in and start giving a bunch more like that and there again your uh, pert negatives these are just about as important as your findings sometime uh you know, the patient has chest pain, but they deny shortness of breath. You want to be able to point that part out to them. Now, uh, past medical history, you know, they may want to tell you about things that uh, happened years ago that really don't have a role in this. That's when you might want to direct questions back on course. Uh, there again, uh, it's great to let the patient talk, to put their side of the story in, but how much is too much? And my philosophy is if they get away from the call at what's going on, then okay, I'm gonna direct them back. So that's me controlling that. Cause uh, uh, you know, they feel it's important, it may be attributive, but you know, the gout they had four years ago probably don't have a lot to do with her heart rate at 180 right now. So this, Think about things like that. And there again, why did I do it that way? Because I could say why. Uh, sample, it is something that kind of keeps you in order. Like, uh, and the reason I say uh, fall back on your training when your judgment's clouded is like, what well, did I miss something? And I, I use this sample code because it keeps me in line. Have I missed anything? Have I missed anything? Okay, now I've covered all of that. So, uh, last oral intake, yeah, that's. You know, they, it's a good idea to know when last time they ate, in case they got to go to surgery or anything like that, or it may have a role, uh, playing a role in what else might be going on with it. Uh, well, I hadn't ate in three days. So would that be a good indication of why they might be feeling weak today? So, I mean, just things like that, it could be really, uh, it, it really helpful with that. Events leading up to the illness or injury, what were you doing when this happened? I mean, uh, or you, see how high you can climb in that tree or were you outside working in the yard what happened what was 
there, I, those questions were leading. It should have been that way. But what were you doing when this happened? Uh, has this ever happened before? So uh, explain to me what went down today. Uh, sorry. I got two screens here going. I'm just trying to keep up with it. Hit the wrong button. Alcohol and drugs. Uh, that could, uh, it can complicate things for the simple reason. Uh, some of the symptoms or problems uh, may be confused. It could be uh, disguised or hidden, not apparent. Or maybe they're trying to hide some things. They may deny the use of it, and which they often do. Some people will tell you, man, I'm, I had a guy tell me the other day, he said, man, I am loaded. Uh, so I, you know, appreciated that clarity about it, but I already knew that, but anyway, it's good for them to tell you that. So, but like sometimes people with chemical dependency, that can be unreliable. Uh, you know, they may lie to you about it, or I had one, two reasons. They just tell me, man, I need help. You know, I'm, I'm on, I'm on just about everything. I'll take it. I need help. So just bear that with a, uh, when you get this information, uh, we're talking about establish a rapport with your patients. And this don't mean you got to grab them and hug them and fall in love with them and all that stuff. But it talks about to where you've got to, uh, when I'm trying to get information from them, simply like the other night where, about wearing a mask, you know, uh, this patient didn't want to wear one. And I said, all right, man, I said, look, you're sick already. You definitely don't want to uh, take a risk of contracting something else. I said, you don't know who I've been exposed to tonight. And I said, where we're going at the hospital, there's a very high potential of you catching something. And uh, so that, you know, that's just kind of a rapport. And uh, he put the mask on and wore it. Uh, so, and sometimes you may have to uh, reassure them that what you're telling them is going to be in confidence because uh, they may be worried about that now. Uh, physical and abuse, violence, uh, that needs to be reported to, you know, at least the ER staff, supervisor, some states, I know Mississippi is, where you're actually required to do that reporting yourself. You actually can be held responsible if it's not being reported uh, to, uh, to report this to the appropriate authorities. If, uh, you know, if you suspect that that's going on, you need to get law enforcement involved. You may need to pass information if, uh, someone is being hurt, threatened, or threatened to be killed, you know, that does fall outside of patient confidentiality. Uh, just know that a lot of times these patients might not want to answer questions in front of the person that may have assaulted them. So and the, the aggressor still may be present somewhere around like that. They might not just want to ask questions in front of them. Uh, domestic abuse calls, that can be very, very, very dangerous. I've seen where you go to help one, and then the family members turn on uh, turn on the person that's intervening. Uh, some of my worst calls in EMS were domestic disputes that turned deadly. Uh, I've seen people where they've killed their kids, their ex spouses, the kids' friends that were staying over. So domestic deals can be uh, can be very bad. Uh, it's hard to be sometimes non-judgmental when you're around persons that they're suspected of doing abuse. Uh, one thing is you don't want them to shut everything out and prevent treatment from someone that may be hurt. So try to, uh, you know, be observant, be open-minded, have a high index of suspicion. But uh, remember your main goal there is to try to safely get to one that they've called for or patient, uh, get them to the hospital. Uh, sometimes I've been overly suggestive of a person that I suspected was being abused and said, hey, uh, you really need to go get that checked. Yeah, that looks bad. Yeah, that, that, that really looks bad. And the reason I'd done it and played it up like that was to actually get them away from the person I suspected abusing them. So that's just some things that uh, to be aware of that could happen. Uh, you know, a lot of this here, man, you know, I don't... Uh, it's not a common question that I'd ask of somebody. Uh, that's some type of rare, op, rare deal to where it was uh, uh, 
pertinent. Now I have asked, uh, you know, is there any way you could be pregnant? And they're like, well, I said, hey, you know, have you had unprotected sex before? And I'm worried about people that had uh, like abdominal pain or suspected pregnancy issues or uh, things like that. But I tried to keep it professional and pertinent to that. You know, they may have severe abdominal pain. I'm suspecting PID or something like that. And sometimes these questions have to be asked. Uh, any female childbearing age who has a lower abdominal pain or something like that, you, you, you might need to think, consider them that they could possibly be pregnant. You know, any female childbearing age, severe abdominal pain, syncope, you know, that could be, a, until proven otherwise, that could be an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, I will ask, I do ask questions quite a bit, like if it's uh, uh, abdominal pain in females or something like that, where I might be suspecting pregnancy, I will ask, when was your last menstrual period? And uh, you really, that is not of a reliable as an indicator that it used to be for, used to be before a lot of these new medications to where it's very intermittent, uh, that, you know, the routine then was every month. So those questions sometimes are not as reliable as they are they used to be now. Uh, if they call you for cramping, abdominal pain, fever, things like that, it may be very well appropriate to ask about, do you have any problems uh, with your period or do you have any urop urinary problems? Does it hurt or burn to go to the bathroom? Uh, those are some questions that would be pertinent uh, to that. The uh, You may want to ask about uh, had a young lady a little while back and I asked about, uh, she's having severe chest, severe chest pain, get worse when breathing. So, you know, I'm thinking, okay, that age that I asked her, I said, do you take birth control pills and stuff like that? And I asked her, what do you do during the day? Are you pretty, uh, do you get up and run a lot, move around a lot? She said, no, I, work, I have a desk job. And uh, so I'm, I'm thinking, Hey, you know, that could very well be a PE or pulmonary embolus. So questions like that that are pertinent, then it's, it does fall in line with that. Sometimes they don't want to tell you. Uh, I've transported one that was bleeding very bad from her vaginal area, and she didn't want me checking her, didn't want nothing like that. She stayed wrapped up, and she told me that uh, she was doing sit-ups, exercising real hard, and it just started. I said, okay, okay. Uh, I did start IV or everything like that. Uh, it was unusual. I didn't really believe that that could happen but anyway i didn't I just what judgment took her to the hospital and when we got her over to the room i heard her telling the nurse that she said i didn't want to say nothing to him about it but somebody had uh, abused her with a foreign object so i knew that that was a possibility but she wouldn't want to get into it whether it was whatever caused it i treated it appropriately uh male patients sometime Urinary symptoms, you got to ask about uh, burning, swelling, uh, anything like that, any trauma. Uh, sometimes what you'll see in males is they get a epidermitis of the inf infection of the uh, the ducts going to the testicles. It could be all up into the bladder. Sometimes it can get very infected and uh, very painful, very swollen. So that might be uh, appropriate. I had a... Uh, and how do you ask somebody like that? Do you, you know, a lot of people don't understand these big medical terms. And just a few nights ago, I had a young male that was complaining of severe right lower abdominal pain. And uh, I asked him to move his legs. When he moved his legs, he said one hurt more than the other. And I asked him, I said, hey, man, are both, do you have both testicles in your scrotum? And he looked at me funny. He said, yeah, yeah. Because then you got to think about, you know, could that be a testicular torsion uh, for one's withdrawn or retracted or anything like that. That's just some things that, uh, you know, you wouldn't want to do that in front of everybody, but, you, you know, ask about it. But, you know, he looked at me funny when I said that, and I explained to him why. I said, I don't think this is your case, however, but young males uh, can get to where their testicles will get twisted, and it it's very painful. They're usually rolling around on the ground, and they will get they can get all the delauded that I can give them. Uh, The uh, history taken with some people, like I said, it takes cooperation. I hate getting the silence. 
the silent treatment. Some people just don't want to talk. And honestly, you know, I didn't like it, but I've calmed down a lot. I guess my older age, and I'll just simply tell them, hey, the patient's not cooperative with uh, giving me information. He's choosing to remain silent. You know, because uh, why would you make excuses for something you can't help? It is what it is. Hey, they won't talk to me. So just just relax. You can't do anything about it. But maybe they will try to be patient. Maybe explain to them why you need another information. Uh, sometimes it may be that they're uh, they're scared to talk. They don't know what to tell you, or uh, they simply just don't uh, trust you. They don't want nobody to know. Can't really do a lot about it. Uh, overly talkative. Uh, Stimulants, some types of uh, anxiety issues will cause this, but stimulants, caffeine consumption, uh, cocaine, methamphetamines, over-talkative or uh, won't shut up, jumping from subject to subject. Uh, when this is going on, you, it's okay to let them express yourself to a point, but there again, my limit is, is when they start getting away from the call that we're on, it's time to reel them back in. The uh, A direct... Try to direct the patient, you know, to stick to the facts by repeating simply what they told you. Uh, here's what you told me earlier. Uh, and, it, it, and see how that changes. Uh, they, you know, sometimes their behavior is uh, controlled or is chosen. But there again, repeat back to them what uh, you heard them say. Make sure the information you heard is correct. You might want to uh, say, so, "Well, here's what you told me. Is this, you know, is this correct? Is this what we're, we want to go on?" So, uh, the uh, but be careful with these patients. Sometimes they can switch back and forth. It may be a fit of you know manic depressant where they get manic, and then just in a just in a second, the next statement they can get to a. Uh, they can get to a state of depression and start crying and cutting up with. So uh, anxiety patients, there again, a lot of anxiety patients are really not able to put their finger on why they feel so bad. Uh, the uh, It can happen like even in a house to where you're, the family, you're not there, you're not even there for the family, but the EMS, the family is uh, of the patient. You know, they're not able to cope. They get carried away. They uh, and anxiety, anxiousness can exhibit signs of psychological shock. Now, the term pseudo seizure uh, is one that a lot of people laughed at for a while. You know, pseudo means false, but they're now saying that can be actually a diagnosis to where people become so anxious that they just don't know how to react and they call it like pseudo seizures and that they can be driven or can be a part of uh, severe anxiety. So also think about how it could be, you know, it, it could be a low blood glucose. Uh, it could be hypoxia as to why they're being anxious. I've seen that before. Uh, sometimes People are so anxious because they feel like nothing can be done. But, you know, I always assure people, hey, there's people smarter than me in a lot of these areas that are able to we get you to where we need to go. So uh, be confident when you got these patients. And it's good that if you and your partner kind of stand side by side so you're not challenged. And when I say challenge, uh, sometimes uh, when they recognize you don't want them to try to play one against the other. And a lot, that does happen sometimes. So if I'm on a site call with, with a partner, I like for us to stand, you know, almost shoulder to shoulder and uh, talk to the patient that way to realize, you know, they're dealing with a team. And uh, because you got to show some structure on this call, that's simply you taking control. Uh, anger and hostility. Now, it, it took me years to not take everything personally. Uh, someone will get mad and upset. You figure, hey, they're just, they're hollering at the ambulance crew. They're not hollering at, Joe Blow paramedic or something like that. That's so try not to take it personally. Keep it in perspective if you can. It does take patience with this. And uh, 
you know, how often do we get to a scene and what took y'all so long? I can't believe this. I've been waiting forever. And they'll sit there and argue with you longer than what it would take to actually do the call. So uh, try not to take it personally. I don't apologize for a blame that's not mine. Uh, I, mean, I can't help it, sir. I try not to be confrontational. But I'm not going to say, sir, I'm sorry. We got stopped by a train. I'll just say, hey, I got stopped by a train. Couldn't make it. Uh, posture, position, facial expressions, watch things like that. Don't always, uh, you know, rely on nonverbal cues when someone can start getting mad or angry. Uh, if the scene is not safe or secure, leave it. And uh, never, cases like this, never let a potentially violent or hostile patient leave the room by itself. There again, I'm not going to chase after people that could possibly hurt me. And I've had, and I've been, a, and I've, I've objected, I'm resistant to it, to where I've had cops and other people say, well, look, we'll just one of you come in. No, no, no. We are a team. Uh, you don't want to get your partner separated like that uh, with, away from you. But, you know, I say, well, can just one of you come in? No. It's both or none. And uh, because you don't want them to get one person in there that they think that they may take advantage of or hostage wise or things like that. It's just some things. Uh, Will it happen? I don't know. But do we want it to happen? If it's something you can protect and not get involved in, then yeah, then uh, then just simply don't do it. Intoxication. Uh, a lot of times unreliable. On the other hand, I've seen some pretty honest drunks. You know, it's like, how many beers you had, sir? He said, man, I'm loaded. I probably had 24. And uh, so... But there again, their information is not reliable. We'll hold up a cord or anything like that. Uh, don't automatically think that the patient's condition is being drunk. Uh, I, I've done that before. I made that mistake one time. Uh, the guy had uh, was very, very drunk and uh, had gotten a fight in a bar. He got hit in the head a couple times. And on the way to the hospital, this is when I was a young paramedic. And this is what I learned from. But on the way to the hospital, I, this guy was like uh, getting combative and started getting smart aleck and stuff like that. And then he just quit acting up at all. I thought he was giving me the silent treatment. Guy had a subdural hematoma. So there again, uh, don't get caught into that vacuum. So easy to do. So uh, but don't automatically think that they're drunk. Could be their sugar and things like that. Now, crying and upset, well, you know, a crying patient is a breathing patient. That's one thing you can look at it. Uh, they could be in pain, mostly overwhelmed. You don't really know what they happened or what's going through. Uh, I took a lady from her house the other day to the nursing home. She was crying and upset. Well, man, that's probably one of the most significant days of her life, you know, to be able to take out of your own home and be put in a place like that. Very, very, you know, routine call for most of us. Very, very a uh, big deal in somebody's life. So uh, try to be sympathetic, treat them with respect and dignity. There again, you know, uh, what, you know, it, it, could, it could very well, the tables be turned. And if, you know, we're all humans. We've probably had those moments where we were down, uh, sad, upset. And so try to put yourself in their shoes when it's like that. Uh, depression. It's uh, right now the leading cause of disability worldwide. Ant antidepressants are being manufactured now more than any other medication. Uh, and a depression is real. You know, a lot of times it runs in families. There's different grades of it, different types, but it does run in families a lot of times. Now, some everybody has an occasional day to where they're blue and down and things like that. However, depression is a cycle that they're in, and it, and it just can't break free from it. You know, some. People may experience it. It's good, I think, for people to, to talk about it. Uh, and being the position that I used to have, I had a lot of, I had people that would come and confide with me. And I was surprised that a lot of people that, that uh, really, really had so much in common, but nobody ever talked about it to each other. So uh, especially in our field, it's out there right now. And the suicide rate, with EMS workers is pretty high. It's it's as high as uh, it's higher than police in cities like New York, 
you know, things like that. So uh, just bear that in mind and it's real and don't, do, if it's on you, don't be afraid to ask for help and get some help from it. I've seen six, six people that I've worked in a truck with that, are not, that, had, that have committed suicide. Uh, confusion, behavior, or history, you know, are there any kind of uh, external factors from doing this? Could it be that, the, you know, drugs, trauma, hypoxia, things about that to, to be thinking about? Uh, but confused behavior, you know, that, that that's not normal. Now, we know there's people in the nursing homes that are have dementia and Alzheimer's and things like that. They're confused. That's one thing. But acute confusion is uh, not a normal response. And what, and what causes that is uh, it shows that something's not going on in the brain. It could be the chemicals. It could be uh, psychological. It could be neurological. Remember, there is a difference between the two. So uh, limited cognitive abilities, people that are developmentally challenged, uh, very difficult to deal with sometimes. Maybe somebody else can communicate with them. Sometimes they take somebody else's word over yours and they're able to get somebody close to them to talk to them and to uh, help them understand things. You can't use big words. Uh, I've, I've got kids to allow IVs before if they had an a, a, a animal or a dog. By, you know, and I've taken the plastic part of a, of a gel coat, just to pack it apart and tape to the arm. I've put oxygen on teddy bears and stuff before to get the kid to wear it, or I put the mask on anyway. So anyway, uh, patients with the limited developability or things like that, they uh, need a special way to get to talk to. Language barriers, seeing this a lot now. Uh, I don't know a whole lot of uh, other languages. I can speak a little bit of Spanish enough to order me something to eat. Uh, hand gestures is possible. I've got an app that I downloaded on my phone. Uh, it's a very good, helpful one. Let me see if I can tell you what it is right quick. It's called Translate. It's on the App Store. It's simply called Translate. And you could type in, like, for example, uh, where do you hurt? You could type that in to that, and it will uh, spell it out. It will give it spell it. It will give you the interpretation of it to how you can communicate with like that. But it's a good app, and like I said, the name of it is it's just simply translate. So good thing there with that. Uh, hearing impairments slowly and clearly. It can be. I know it's frustrating for the person trying to speak, but it's ten times more frustrating than the person that can't hear. And of course, visually impairments. Some people just can't see good. Uh, you need to explain to them uh who you are they might not recognize the uniform uh if you ever took a taken a gym a gyms class geriatric emergency medical service classes i got one next month february 13th but i actually put glasses on people and stuff like that to where they can't see good and uh, tell them to straighten their pills out and care of their food and things like that just kind of gives you an idea of what's going on so that's where we're going to stop tonight at uh, slide number 58, it'll be a kind of a short, quick class coming. Uh, see, the next time we do this will be Saturday the 30th at 6 o'clock. And there again, if you don't make it, it'll be recorded as this one is recorded. Uh, tonight, your uh, code or PIN number is going to be, let's see, 128. 848-128-848 is your PIN code for tonight. Okay, does anybody uh, have anything, questions, comments, or concerns? All right. Well, y'all be safe out there. Have a good couple of days. I'll see you Saturday night. I'll upload this recording later. Uh, later tonight and there again Saturday if you're not able to be on there it won't be a real long one we're trying to finish up patient assessment but try to go through your uh, documents that you have your uh, your online book study materials and things like that all right if there's nothing else I'm gonna go ahead and sign off now and uh, everybody have a good night